Nice. Damon, uh, how are you feeling? I'm good. <laughs> you look like you're doing very, very well. Um, I feel like this table looks like the remnants of what happened last night. Um, I think what I, I love about this special episode that we're doing is that this is such a vibe and it looks better than the other studio that we <laughs> <laughs> That other studio feels like a great origin story because it's like we're like a, like a dungeon, just having a great conversation. Mm -hmm. I will say this though, I have to give you your flowers for several reasons today, but the first place I'm gonna give you your flowers is the hey, fact that- you flowers today. Yeah, you're getting flowers. Black men get flowers. You can take all those home when we're done with the show. Okay. I'm being serious. Just throw them all over the floor. No, I have to give you your flowers because the episode that we did, you acted so not like so daisical about it. Like, oh, that was fun. We were potting. Most popular episode we've ever done. What? The most popular episode that we've ever done is with DJ Damage. Burr, 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 burr. Burr, 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 burr. You're back. I am so excited. Um, I'm also very hungover and hydrating. I think it's hilarious that there's uh, edibles, uh, shroom tea, uh, Don Julio, and um, champagne in front of me, and water. Uh, Damage, you have me looking crazy because all you have is water. <laughs> For now, uh, last night was an amazing night, and by amazing, I mean it was my birthday. And we are now in our home, well, a home, I should say. Mm -hmm. Because we're in Los Angeles, this is a rental home, right? I think a lot of times when you see some people in LA shooting amazing footage, like, this is my house, right? We're gonna say this, um, I'm renting this house, I do not uh, own this house. I feel like in Los Angeles, everybody rents homes and lies. Half the reality shows that you watch. Oh, see, I don't watch those reality shows. But half know. of them, I know people who are on them. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're They'll right. They'll have a studio. No, I know what you're talking but about. But suddenly Love and Hip Hop comes. Yes, I get and it. And you're in a $2.5 million house. Yep, and none of your right. friends know how to show up to your house room because like, bitch, we know you But also, I wouldn't want people filming in my house Anyway, like I don't want no one to see my real house, so I probably would do the same thing. That's true, but there's a difference between someone like me being honest and saying I'm renting a $2.5 million home versus the fact that I'm pretending that I own a $2.5 million home. Those are well, two yeah. very different conversations. Yeah, I, okay, yeah. I mean, we're shooting a, a, a pod right now, so it's right. different, but if we're shooting like a reality show, I don't blame people for renting a space because I don't want anybody in my real house with their cameras. But do you blame them for lying about the space being their home? On like Love and Hip Hop, lie yeah. it up. The whole show's a lie. Is that the new, is that our new mantra? Lie it up. For 2022, lie it up? Everybody's lying. It's not just reality shows, social media, everybody's lying. Well, so it's crazy because we, we had a couple reality stars um, in the room last night at my birthday party, including our very own Jason Lee. Mm -hmm. um, that was very fun. We played Black Card Revolt, and it was very interesting when one of the questions was about love and hip hop, and the room had to pick an answer. Jason was like, no, I'm on the show. I know the real answer. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, that's so crazy. I think we're going to get to a point where everybody knows a reality star. Yeah, I was on Love & Hip Hop. I really? Know. Wait, what did you do on Love & Hip Hop? I was, an, on, I was part of the cast because Jason was on That's it. That's true, you were. Oh, man. How did that feel? That was fine. I think the worst reality show that I was featured on that I didn't want to be featured on was Basketball Wives. What did you do on Basketball Wives? My friend Spicy Madi, she's a relationship coach. Shout out to Spicy Madi. She was doing something for the girl Jennifer, like a speed dating thing. And they didn't you tell were me. man me on basketball wise? I don't know if I was man me, but it was a bunch of guys like she was doing speed dating. So That's I was man. trying to not get picked. You so were, like I've been had it was like bingo. And whoever gets bingo, you go up there and they gotta like do a quick interview with Jennifer. I had bingo like 30 times. I was like, I don't want to go up. So you intentionally tried not to get picked? It was like two hours when I was like, I gotta eventually go up. They're gonna be like, we called all the it's no way you didn't get <laughs> called. So did you give all wrong answers? No, I went up there and she was like, and the first question was like, oh, have you cheated before? I was like, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, his name's Damage and he's cheated. I was like, whatever, yo, I don't want to be here. <laughs> and then they chopped it up all whatever and made it look all crazy and everybody, I didn't, for, for me, I don't watch Basketball Wives. I didn't get how big the show was. Oh, it's, it was so major. everybody at that time. seen it. It was like, oh, Damage, I seen you on Basketball Wives. Did you have any exes hit you up like, why are you on there telling people you were a cheater? No, it was just funny. Like, I think people are happy, like proud of me. I didn't know how big the show was, so a lot of people it's was huge. like, oh, you out there in L.A. doing your thing like you were in Basketball Wives. I was like, okay. Do you have a clip? Is there a way? Like, I want to see a clip. No, it is. It well, used to be online. That's from years ago. We're going to look at Damage's clip about him being man meat on Basketball Wives. Um, I'm actually really excited that my birthday is over because one of the things I learned last night is that I do not enjoy throwing my own birthday parties. It's stressful. Here's the thing that I, and this is something I, I need to talk to myself about 
I've been in relationships where I threw my own birthday party and I now realize my next relationship, if that happens, it's going to be a problem for me. Because I watch all these couples that I'm friends with and they'll be like, oh, it's my girl's birthday, Blue, can you help me? I've helped so many people help their partners throw birthday parties mm -hmm. and I've never had anybody throw me one. And it's, I don't want to say it's making me bitter, but I'm like, am I choosing the wrong people? Why does nobody want to throw me a party? When we lay in the same bed for like two years, like it's weird. Oh, I tell everybody yeah, I my bucket list for a relationship is for someone to throw me a party. The last time somebody threw me a party is when I was five years old. I am several decades away from being five years old. So for, <laughs> <laughs> for the past 30 years, you have all failed me. Um, I don't want to say I'm bitter about it, but yeah, I think yesterday, one of the things that bothered me was like, I'm doing all this for myself and mm -hmm. that didn't feel good. And yeah. that was interesting because I've done everything for myself. And I think at a certain point you want to know, I said this is my year of receiving and something of that stature would have been a great thing to receive and not be so stressed doing it on my own. And I want to give you your flowers again for this is because uh, Jeff was the only support I had yesterday. Shout out to Chef Jeff who was in the building. Oh. We love you, Jeff. Jeff, a.k.a. Mr. Red Beans and Rice. Yes, uh, Damage is still thinking <laughs> Jeff in the corner. <laughs> Jeff and that smile is getting a shout out. For those of you who are watching us on YouTube or on Patreon, um, Jeff's in the building. He's been feeding us all day, even though the party nonstop, Jeff's been feeding us and also eating because, you know, you have to eat mm -hmm. your own food. Um, and I felt so much support from Jeff showing up to cook. And I was used to that, not to get into the Zodiac. You guys know it doesn't take me very long to get into the science. Jeff and I are Tauruses. So when another Taurus friend takes care of me, it almost makes sense because we all nurture each other. Mm -hmm. but what I wasn't expecting, Damage, was for you to show up 45 minutes early. <laughs> I always show up early. You showed up 45 minutes early. You went to the store and bought stuff that Jeff didn't even like have. No, I, he had it. He needed more of it. Yeah, so but like, Jeff was prepared. Jeff was prepared. Chef but, Jeff came prepared. But you re-upped for him before the party even started. You were the first person there. You made it to the party before I did. I was back at the house getting the mm -hmm. Black Magic Iced Tea. Um, shout out to my Black Magic Iced Tea. I think that recipe, I should market it. It makes everybody it feel the good. Fun. For those who don't know what Black Magic Iced Tea, the reason you don't know is because I made it up. If anybody else uses that term, they stole it from me. Plagiarism is real. It is shroom <laughs> tea <laughs> mixed with sweet tea, mixed with herbs and spices, and just a couple gallons of whiskey. Um, wow. Okay. That makes total sense because I started like mm -hmm. declining. Oh, I saw it. Because whiskey makes me cozy. Oh, you were cozy. Yeah. There's a couple of shots where you're caught up on the couch. I'm like, are his, are his feet up? Yeah, whiskey's like my go to sleep. Like, if I knew it was whiskey in there, I probably wouldn't have had any. It's so fu funny because Rosa was there. Shout out to Rosa Acosta. She's one of the people who showed up. And she heard it was shroom tea. And she was one of the few people who was not upset about it being shroom tea. Because people get scared when they hear shrooms, right? She was upset about the whiskey. She was like, okay, Blue, I'll drink shrooms, but I'm not going to drink whiskey. Oh, no, yeah. If I knew it was whiskey, I probably wouldn't drink it because it just makes my mood just super like, mm. But you were you were like a Care Bear. I feel like you somebody just need to rub your tummy and put you to bed. I didn't feel like being a Care Bear. I wanted to nap. Oh, you wanted to sleep, sleep. It was, I had a good time. I had a good time, too. But we're both from the East Coast. And I will say this. Um, it was atypical, I think, for people who are shiny. And that's, that's the term I always use for my friends who I think are doing amazing things. They're shiny people. And I also say shiny because I recognize that folks around them gravitate towards them sometimes for the good and for the wrong reasons. We're going to get mm -hmm. into that in a second. You know, you guys know that we like to like have the fourth wall disappear. Marcus is our director. Uh, what do you call him? Mr. Vision? Mr. Visionary? <laughs> Marcus is a whole vibe. I can tell you have beard oil, Marcus. <laughs> Natural beard oil, um, but no, like. I don't know how I feel about that. But you have a baby face, though, so you don't want to show off a baby I'm face. I'm over it, yo. You're over having a baby I'm in face. In my 30s, I need this beard to sprout. I'm getting a lace front beard. Period. You've heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. If DJ Damage suddenly has a luxurious Philly beard, y'all better support it. You know what? We wear lace fronts, and y'all, y'all. Exactly. We need to normalize but, my lace front beard. But do y'all support it though? You want to get a lace front beard? That's right. Because I gave a shout out to Marcus, our director, and you saw that, and you said you want one too. Mm -hmm. But you don't like lace fronts on girls. Make that make sense, brother man. Well, I'm all about balance. I'm a Libra, uh -huh. and I think it's time to settle the score. So, um, I understand why women wear lace fronts. I've uh -huh. totally, I, I get all of it, right? Uh -huh. I don't like the way they look. Not mm -hmm. all of them. It's not like a blanket statement. Like, I don't like any lace fronts. Right. But a lot of these lace fronts I see, be, they be lace fronting. So I'm like, you know what? Why not? Why can't we? Why? Like, I don't understand the shame when men are dyeing their beards or lace fronting. Do whatever you got to do, man. Mm. As long as it look, I'm about, I'm a person that, as long as it looks good, I support it. Uh, but here's the thing. Looking good is subjective. 
As long as it look good to me, okay. I will support it. Okay. I mean, and, and to be fair, Libras are not about balance. They seek balance. There you go. Well, I'm seeking, seeking balance with this. <laughs> when this beer comes through, <laughs> no, for real, when I get this beer, I don't want to hear nothing from nobody. Have you seen America's Next Top Model when Tyra Banks put a lace front beard on that man and he looked crazy? No. <laughs> it was like something straight out of Tyler Perry. I just supported it. <laughs> My DMV accent to come I've been seeing some good lace front beards on TikTok, too. Okay, like here's elite, the thing. Elite. I think when black men feel beautiful, and you guys don't, are not allowed to use that word a lot of times, but I think it's a, a, a good word. When black men feel beautiful or handsome, you guys move differently. That's so right. It, so if a man in a lace front feels better, I'm that moving. makes it makes my life easier. That's right. But in the same thing, if you walk around looking like the Tyler Perry guy, now I'm going to have a problem. No, you're going to have to deal with it. No, if you look crazy and I care about you, no, you the same way. If my if my wig was waving at you and lifting halfway off my forehead, I wouldn't say a damn thing. Blue, that is your wig. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about as with friends. I'm talking about if you were in a relationship uh-huh. and your partner had a lace front that looked like like struggles. I've learned from somebody very wise. You don't speak on black women's hair. So I, I already said enough by not liking lace fronts. I, I, I understand. I said enough. I agree with whoever told you Woo! that not I, to speak on black women's I said hair. It, I said it enough. But I'm saying that if you are in a relationship, you don't think that it makes sense to be honest with your partner about what part of their aesthetic you like and don't I've like? I've been there. And, well, been how there. did you say it though? Because it's the how. It's nah, not the what, it's the I've how. I've been there. I didn't say much. What I've did, been no, there. It don't take much to be offensive, Damage. What did you say? It don't matter. I, I ain't say much and they ain't like that. So I learned What did like, you say though? Whatever journey you gonna be on, I just gotta ride with the journey. Damage, look into my eyes. What, what did you say? I didn't say much. I really didn't say anything. I know you didn't say much. I, didn't just, I just didn't say I liked it. So you didn't compliment it and no. she got upset? Uh, yeah. Yep. Well, that's different. Because here's the thing, look. right? If someone wants to say, that's real. Let me say something right now. Someone wants to say, "Hey, babe, I like your hair better when it's um, curly or when it's an updo or when it's whatever." That's very different than saying, "I hate that lace front." Yeah, I mean, so for me, it's like th- certain things I particularly just don't like, like right. or I just don't go for like extremely colored hair. I've never been into that. What's extremely colored? Because that's like subjective. Like hot too. pink. Hot pink. Or like a. Like a neon yellow, orange. Like I just never been into. So that. colors that do not exist in nature. I had very, very saturated, like red hair, for God, like five years. Mm-hmm. And I was at the time dating someone who did not like uh, what he called hood rat colors. And, mm-hmm. but he loved that red hair though. That's what it, I'm saying. It was a very vibrant red. It does not exist in nature. But I'm not going to lie. In that situation that happened, I didn't like the hair at all at first. It was it was very vibrant, and it also was a total 360 of the style that I was accustomed to. So say, like, you usually rock long hair, and right. then somebody just cut their hair super short. And then it was, like, vibrant. Oh, I see. But then after a while, I was like, yo, I'm kind of feeling this. Like, you know, like... You, so you I, got used to it. I needed time to adjust. Okay. I will say I do have, we all have hair biases, and I think because of what happened with the slap, hashtag the slap, and Chris Rock, and Jada Pinkett Smith, we've all learned the hard way to be careful about how we talk about people's hair. Yeah, that's why I was like, I said enough by saying I don't no, like lace No, this is a safe front. space. Our audience knows your heart. It's probably so popular, yeah, right. damage. And, uh, ain't I no will say this. There's no such thing as a safe space these days. Safer space. There is such thing as a safer <laughs> space. This, this space is safer the most. For me, one of my hair biases, because we all have a hair bias, is when really small women wear really heavy wigs, <laughs> and look like a grasshopper. Like them church wigs? No, 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 no. I'm talking about like a size two with a 30 pound curly lace front that looks like it's too heavy for her neck to hold it up. As a woman, I personally mm. like, sis, like the scale is off. So for me, that's not about judging the hair. The scale is off. I think that like perfect example, when I am bigger, because you know weight can fluctuate from women. I tend to have big hair to go with my big voluptuous body. When I tend to lose weight, I tend to cut my hair shorter or have more like slender hair to go with my body. But mm-hmm. when I see a small girl with heavy looking hair, I'm like, aren't you hot? Like it just it, it I personally have a thing about that. I don't that, know personally. if I've ever seen that before. You've never I probably seen, don't like in it. In LA? I probably don't like there's, it. There's a lot of girls on the I West Coast know. with heavy, a lot of small girls with heavy wigs in LA. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't think I've. I, it, them I, I would have be, to see a like, example. If you have think... a 30 inch, 20 pound uh, wig on, and you a buck fifteen, that is my personal hair bias. But much more so because it just feels uncomfortable, and mm. I like women to look comfortable. You go, girl. 
You go. You the same the, man who doesn't like lace fronts. He's like, you wear that way. He's like, you're not about to cancel you get me. You in the pool and you over... float with that thing. You wear that way. But that. you know, you know what's so interesting though too though, a lot of men who have um, preferences with hair because it, it, it's a preference conversation. Mm -hmm. What they don't realize is some of the things that you like are very expensive. So it's not that she doesn't have the same taste level. She can't afford the thing that you like. Perfect example. I had a, a really beautiful lace front that I loved. That shit cost a thousand dollars. When I was budgeting, my, mind you, the person I was dating said, we need to be on a budget. You know, you like pretty things. We need to whatever. I got a $250 version, and he was talking all the shit about how he didn't like lace fronts. I was like, bruh, the version you like, we can't afford. So I think a lot of times, the black women that I know who get upset, they're like, the things that y'all like are expensive, and so you're saying you want a down-to-earth mm. woman, but you want an expensive hair piece. I, I mean, I don't know. I can't, I can't speak for men at all. Um, but <laughs> most of the guys I know, we just like the natural stuff, like the stuff that that's expensive. I can believe that. Yeah, I don't know how much expensive. it costs. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Um, I, I, I go for whatever looks nice. Like if you yeah. can't afford a nice do, if you slick that thing in a ponytail and it's just put together, then go for that. Like, but you saw a girl in a ponytail at a party we went to, and you said the ponytail was too small. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't play yourself. So if you have don't low hair yourself. density. And you wear a ponytail that's too small. You better add a little attachment or something to that. So now you don't mind the lace front if it's giving body to the... <laughs> Look, do whatever you want, honestly. You can don't... talk about your preference, black yeah, man. Yeah, do whatever y'all want. I just know I'm not going to love it. You know, that, and who cares, right? Who cares what I love? Just do whatever. Let... If you look in that mirror and you feel great, that is the hairstyle for you. I don't care the density. Bullshit. It ain't bullshit. You know that? I'm going to say this. You know There's not a single person on this earth who does not want their partner to find them desirable. And if I do a hairstyle that I love and the person I'm sleeping with and cooking for and spending life with does not like that hairstyle, whether I decide to be an independent woman and do it anyways, I'm gonna, it's gonna hurt my feelings a little bit that you don't like the way I look. Well, you know, maybe, you know, check in before you do the do, you know, like get a little, get a little preview, like check in, a little consultation, like, yo, I'm not doing this style of work. Uh, I don't know, like you might get one of those or you just might not care. You like might be one of the people that, Hey, I'm changing my hair, and that's what it is. Yeah, and that's totally fine too. Well, that I don't mean I'm gonna love it though. You know what? I will say to you be you can't make me love it. To be fair, there are certain women who do not think they should check in with the guy about anything, even yeah. if they're dating him. And I say for those women, if you don't care about him to check in or to whatever, then you also can't be mad at him if he just doesn't like it because you didn't want to have a conversation about that's it. What I will I'm say that. Saying, but I will know. say that. But for me, I feel like if I do check in and all the stuff you want is expensive shit that you didn't realize was expensive, at what part in a relationship do you feel like you want to help me out with that? Like, if we both agree that we like something on me, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a steep uh, maintenance cost, yeah. are you willing to put your money where your heart is? I would, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I've, I think I've been fortunate enough, most of the situations I've been in, I think the... Yeah, a lot of them do their own hair. Yeah. So... I think I've just been lucky in that sense where the styles that they wanted to put on, they kind of created themselves. Oh, yeah. you mean that? Yeah, no, that's not my ministry. Um, yeah, I'm, they've been really good at that. So shout out no. to them. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Or shout out to people who find great stylists. Um, I, I I like to let professionals do the thing that their, their, their purpose is. My ministry is not hair. I know it looks good, but I'm not the girl who's built to do all that. I didn't grow up braiding my doll's hair. I grew up getting $40 every Friday to go to the beauty salon to look cute. Because I came from a West Indian family where my mother always wanted me to look presentable. West Indians are very big about being presentable even when we're poor. And so it didn't matter how broke we were. Every Friday I was getting $40 to get a blowout. So I always had like the pretty girl aesthetic of like the, the Dominican blowouts. My hair, my hair is really freaking long. Mm -hmm. When I got older, I realized because I'm Afro-Latina, which means my hair is long but kinky, I was never taught how to blow dry fucking three feet of hair. I can't do that. My arms are not built to do that. I don't know how to swerve it. So I have to pay somebody in Los Angeles like $200. And my thing is $200 for a blowout that lasts a week. Do the math. That's $800 a month for a look that my partner likes, but is not paying any money for it. I don't know who this partner is. I mean, Child. do whatever you like. <laughs> do whatever you like. There's been a couple. So I, I do like whatever you, you like. If you love your hair. Yeah. Like if you love it, then who am I to not? like it you know what's so interesting we're talking about relationships and how to navigate what you like while also wanting to please your partner and i feel like and we talk about this all the time offline about how part of gender wars is everybody's so defensive these days about their autonomy that it almost feels like people think that you are um less of a bad bitch or less of a grown man 
if you want to check in with your partner. It's almost like asking for mm -hmm. a collaboration feels like weakness these days, and it makes me sad that we're having those yeah, kind of conversations. Yeah, gender wars has worn me out. It's I fucking it's, hate it's it. It's attacking my, my mental health because I'm, I'm used to that collaboration. I feel like yeah. if you want to be with somebody, you should... I don't know if you want to call it checking in or something. Like, what's wrong with talking to the person to make sure they find... You know, like, I, yeah. I just... I don't know, but like you said, you say anything like, oh, you know, my girl like when I do this, oh, you a simp. Yeah. Oh, my man like when I do this, oh, you a pick me. And it's like, y'all are getting too extreme. Y'all yeah. all sound extremely single. Like, I mean, and, and, right. I mean, and the thing is, y'all sound extremely There are hurt. simps and pick me's, but a lot of y'all using the words wrong, right? Like somebody used the word gaslighting correctly with me. And I was like, girl, that is not what that word means. You mean incorrectly? I mean, yeah, she used it incorrectly. And I was like, that's not what that word means. And she used it in a way where she was attacking my character. But because she knew gaslight was a word that's meant to attack your character, she didn't care if it replied or not. She was going to throw it at me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I teach workshops on how not to gaslight. I know for a fact you use that incorrectly. And now you're coming for me, too. So I really do think that there are buzzwords like pick me and simp and gaslight that are actually steeped in valid points, mm -hmm. but are being flung around as like cheap shots now. To like invalidate people's point points of view. That makes me a little bit sad. People are bored, yo. People are online critiquing fake stories that they see on Facebook. It'd be like, oh, this one I recently saw. It was like, um, I asked this girl I was talking to for two months for a hundred dollars, and she asked me all these questions like, what do you need it for when I'm gonna get it back? But she didn't know I planned this vacation. I paid whatever amount for the room, whatever amount for the uh, excursions and everything. Blah, blah, blah. And people are going back and forth in the comments. And I'm just like, y'all take this random story that y'all don't even know is true and have a gender war battle about it. This is probably not even real. And if it is, this is a Facebook comment. You know what's it's so certain crazy? things that come from Facebook that I just don't comment on because it's Facebook. You're, it's so funny you mentioned that because that's something itinerary. I actually have that screenshot. That story? Yeah. and I have You want to dive into it? No. Here's the thing why I have that screenshotted. Because my question was, you know, in the same way, and I don't want my Christian friends to get mad at me. To me, the Bible is fables. They're not like they're they're meant to like get a point across, not necessarily be taken literal, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some folks who take the Bible very literally, oh. not fully understanding that they're fables meant to create a story. I smell what you're stepping in. And the funny thing is, for me, is that my first writing gig, when I keep on talking, I hate mentioning this because it sounds so pompous. But my first gig at Harvard, what they hired me for was to write emotional intelligence fables. Let me tell you this. What? I did anything at Harvard. You're going to know about it. So it's crazy. I'm at this. You're going to know about it. <laughs> I'm in this bastion of academia. Man, when I was just walking by Harvard, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to know about it. Right, but like. I, I snuck into the cafeteria at Harvard and had a meal. You're going to know about Harvard it. Harvard is the other HU. Not to be mistaken with Howard, because y'all know I love me some Howard. But no, like. When I was writing those fables, I was like, this is what it feels to write the Bible. Like, I have a point I'm trying to make, but I'm using this, like, this narrative as a vehicle to get my point across. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I realized about those fake narratives that they put, because I really do think that story was fake, was a man was being generous. He had internalized some bitterness because he didn't feel appreciated, because probably women in his life didn't make him feel beautiful. Let's keep it a buck. And so he thought he was going to test her with a disingenuous like scenario mm -hmm. to see how generous she was. My problem with that whole thinking of testing someone is that you're setting them up to fail because there's a metric that they don't even know they're up against. When you take a test in school, they tell you you're taking a test. You don't walk up to school and ask for milk and they're like, ah, you should ask for chocolate, you're going to detention. Like they tell you you're taking a test. Mm -hmm. And so I think the problem with testing partners is if someone doesn't know the weight of their actions, they're not going to think it's a big deal and they might fail, not because it's their character, but because they don't understand the context. Or it is their character and you're just nah. dealing with the wrong person. Yes, it could be their character. It I could think, be, but I but think it's here's, dangerous. But here's the reality of it, right? It's, and I'm just going to speak on where I come from, what I've seen growing up. I have seen women give so much. Right. I have without asking for anything back. Right. So there is a scenario where you just might be with a selfish person or you could just be a narcissist who's just making up weird tests. Both sides could be true. I just look at the story as just a stupid story to begin with. I think it's it's a stupid story, but I think it's a common occurrence. And my, my pushback on the, the character is I've had a lot of judgmental men that I have dated who they had a connotation to their test that wasn't my reality. So it wasn't my character. Perfect example. Remember when we first met? You're from North Philly. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a verbally abusive West Indian household. There was slang that you used that in context in North Philly was not a big deal. 
and was not in any way a slight to your character. But in my context, being in a verbally abusive household, if I had taken that mindset, I would have falsely judged your character because we had different contexts for the slang you were using. That's why I think it's dangerous to have those tests because we're not all starting from the same place. We have different cultures, different childhoods, different areas that we're from, different regions. And so what means one thing for you could mean something completely different to me. I get that. You know, you know what I'm saying? So that's why no, I, I, I get all I of that, like but that. I, I would be lying to think that people don't do these tests often. It might not be so as literal as, oh, I, I asked her for $100, but I feel like I've talked to mad homegirls who run a, a subtle test or wait a certain amount of time or do some kind of something right. to test somebody. People do that. And if anybody act like they don't, they're lying. People, and I ain't going to say everybody, I hate to blanket everything, but people yeah. do test each other's character. It might not be so, all right, I'm going to ask her for this $100 and how she responds. But people do that, yo. That's how kind of like people gauge each other's character. I have a question, though, because gauging character and testing are different. You know why? Gauging your character means something naturally happened and based on their information that organically revealed itself, I'm seeing your character. A test is I'm creating a false scenario to entrap you. The way we talk about the cops, entrapment is very different than something organically happened. Mm -hmm. So if I'm gauging you, something naturally happened and, you, and I, something revealed itself. A test means I'm intentionally creating a false scenario to mm -hmm. test you. To me, those are very different energy fields. It is different, yeah. and I feel like people do that more than they want to uh, yeah. admit. I do feel like people do that so much they more do than do they want to admit. And I think, I think, I think, gauging, I completely champion. Testing, I think, is toxic. And what's interesting is the I last. I can think of some scenarios in my mind where people have created these fake tests, and I'm that just like, I think is toxic. Ha -ha. But that's what people are. A lot of people, the average person, is dealing with some toxicity. Some toxicity and being toxic are different. Like, you know how you can have an angry moment but not be an angry person? A toxic moment and being a toxic motherfucker are two very different things. And we live in a world where there are a lot of toxic people. And I'm telling you, there's examples of from calling me a Uber or, oh, you know, I couldn't pay my phone bill. You think it's people that run these games. I That's know true. these games firsthand. You know what I mean? So Do it's you like, intentionally fail a test because you're annoyed that you're being tested? Have you ever done that? Like, fail the test despite somebody? Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like you're Absolutely. It's like, oh, you know, oh, my, something's wrong with my car. Can you call me? Like, it's like, you can tell it's an obvious test. It's like, no. Oh. And deal with you how you want to deal with it. Like, but sometimes I think your family and friends create tests that you don't even see. Perfect example, because, you know, I, and this is something that all my close friends know. I think the audience might not know this because I come off so savvy and wise. My blind spot are people that I care about. So I'm the wise friend who becomes very naive and blind when mm -hmm. it's close to my chest. And so I have a lot of guy friends in particular who are like surrogate big brothers. And so when I bring any guy around, whether it's a friend, a colleague, even a boyfriend, whatever kind of guy I bring around, my guy friends are always like, let's see what kind of nigga this is. You know what I mean? And I remember the first time you had hung out with us for Thanksgiving, my friend Carlos was like a big brother to me. We called and I was like, damn, it's damn. We ran out of orange juice for brunch. Can you bring us some? Didn't think nothing of it. This was organic. Mm -hmm. Carlos, who was like, you have a friend named Damage? I was like, yeah. He's like, is he a good dude? Because you know these LA dudes can be a little funny. I was like, no, I think he's a good dude. He's like, so check it. Anybody who cares about you, who heard that you were running around doing this brunch, and you didn't bring orange juice, if he brings, if he goes out of his way to bring the orange juice, he's a good dude who cares about lightening your load. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I would have never thought about that. I just said we ran out of orange juice. And when you walked in with a big old bag of OJ, Carlos was like, ah. My nigga. <laughs> and I was like, what? That's a test? But, but also, and like you said. But it was organic, though. I didn't even, I would have never thought that but myself. But like you said, that's, that test, as you said. It wasn't a test, it was a gauge, not I a, guess. It's, but yeah. it's not a, 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 a test of somebody's character, because some people are just aloof and have right. never done that. And right. that's based on your upbringing. That's based on community. Right. So like you said before, it's like, it's disingenuous. Now, yeah. I mean, I think anybody in my world Oh, you hear, you know, somebody's doing something, you bring something or provide some type of service. Right. But some people are just like, oh, no, they said, come, I'm going to show up. That's my gift to the situation. Right. So sometimes when I, I've been in situations like that where people, you know, it'd be, oh, it'd be nice if you did that and they didn't. But I know it didn't come from any ill intent or any selfishness. It's right. like you're just aloof to the situation. You just didn't come up that way. You don't get it. So, but, but you think somebody directly asking you for help and you ignoring it, it doesn't in any way speak to thought. Oh, yeah. If, somebody, if you like, ask somebody to bring something, they just I thought I said damage help. Like, we need orange juice. And you were like, okay. And I, Well, like, yeah, that's different. But like, yeah. But it's like one thing here and it's like, um, I'm on my way and it's like, oh, man, we didn't get this or did that. 
people ask, oh, do you need me to bring anything? Yeah. It's just based on, you know, I, it's like environments and situations you've been in. But you know what I think what he was getting to? And then he later explained it to me because I was like, Carlos, I was really nervous because Damon is a good dude, but I felt like if he hadn't got the orange juice, it would have been an awkward brunch. And he was like, no, Blue, it wasn't about the orange juice. It was about you constantly inconvenience yourself people that you care about off the rip. Mm -hmm. If someone's known you for two months, I already know what you've done in two months, bitch. And so if someone's only for that long and is not willing to inconvenience you themselves the first time you ask, that's what would have bothered me. And I was like, that makes more sense to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you have a friend who's overly generous and you know how they get down and you watch them ask for the first time, I think you watch how people respond to them finally receiving. But those people yeah. tend to be around all the takers. Yeah, that's true. I do tend to be. <laughs> Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's the super generous person and no one's looking out for them. That's usually how it works. That's the balance of life. I will say this, though, and this is why I, I gave you your flowers earlier. Again, you were the first person to show up to help with Jeff. You were the last person to leave. You helped clean up. Like, one of the things about doing that is I realized that thoughtfulness, I'm starting to feel that being thoughtful might be one of those universal things that for me in particular will make me tap in or tap out. Not because I'm judging, but because it doesn't work for me anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm in a place now where someone not being even thoughtful when I am direct about what I need, I don't think I can create any more excuses for that. I feel like for me, it's exhaustive because it triggers a part of me that's going to want to overcompensate. Do you have anything that you've realized that good or bad for you, it has to be a, a line in the sand because it, do it doesn't work for how you show up? I feel like I am the line in the sand. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been good at that stuff early because my brother deals with that. He's like you. He just gives, 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 yeah. gives, gives. And we talk on the phone. It's another story how somebody left him hanging or, you know, did something foul. And I just like, bro, I tell you, like, I don't move like that. But what is the, a thing that... <laughs> I do not. I don't do it. <laughs> what's, do it. What's a thing that happens that you're like, oh, honey, we can't do this? Like, what's a thing that feels like a line in the sand for you? What's an example? I'm so bad at this because I do it so like it's like part of my my lifestyle. I was like, ah, I won't do it. I just don't. Hmm, that's a good question. It is. What is a line in the sand for me? For me, it's thoughtfulness. Like if me asking you to be thoughtful instead of seeing it as a challenge. Well, to I think rise, I shouldn't have to ask you to do that. So that's why it's already a line in the sand. Like if I have to ask you to be thoughtful to me, then you should not be around me. I shouldn't have to remind you. To be well, reminding is different than asking, right? Because we still have to learn each other when we meet but, people. But and then also when you like, it's this is so many layers to this because what I think is thoughtful and what you think is thoughtful can be different. Exactly. That's why I think the first time you should, I think you should set the medium for what your thoughtful is, and I set the medium for what my, my thoughtful is. And once we both understand our version of thoughtful, then you can gauge if someone is actually being thoughtful or not. But I think assuming it off the rip that somebody's not thoughtful because their version is different can be a little dangerous. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't but that, that's just, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question because I only, I think I only want to surround myself with people that understand the way I am thoughtful, like that, mm. that give, that give but and you don't take. Think you have a responsibility to verbalize it because people can't read your mind? No, I don't. I don't have a responsibility to do that at all. No, but I'm not going to knock you for it. But for people that's going to be in my close circle that I care about, mm -hmm. they're going to understand that. Like we're going to have a, um, a community way of thinking of how we give to each other. Like my best friend, my brother, all my friends, like my real friends that my day ones, mm -hmm. we do similar things. Now, other people, I don't even have that expectation for them. But they learned you too, though. They still Exactly, but happened. I don't have that expectation for them, so they can't really let me down. I'm not even looking for them to do anything. So, so if anything, you're going to... Um, you're going to, what's the word? If anything, you're going to surprise me and I'm going to be happy. Like, oh, shoot, I didn't think you would do that. What is something that is a pleasant surprise when it's done that lets you know that you can lean in? Um. Then we didn't even get to the light stuff. We got right into the emotional. What is a pleasant surprise? I blame surprise. the shroom tea. I'm going to drink some water. I think, like, so for me, I like to check in on people. Mm -hmm. There was a long period of time I was working so much where I couldn't really communicate the way I wanted to with people I cared about. Mm -hmm. So I feel like when people check in on me, that really gives you a lot of cool points. Like, yo, how you doing, man? How you doing out there in LA? How's everything? How's legend? That goes a long way. Just asking somebody how they're doing, even if they don't, even, you know, people be like, oh, I'm fine. And they yeah. might not be fine. And let them know, like, damn, at least somebody was thinking about me. Like, mm. that's something I think is very important. So I used to uh, get mad at my own brother. I'd be like, why you don't call me? Why you don't? 
Oh, we checking on you. Oh man, I just been busy. I'm like, yeah, but that's an excuse. Like we're family. Mm -hmm. Like I checked on you, check in on me too. Like that's why, you know, they have those sayings all over me. Check on your strong check friend. Check on your strong, but that's real. Check yeah. on people. Like, it, and it takes no time. You know what's interesting? Like, you know, I'll be like, Damon, how's your heart? How are you doing? Like, I, and I do those check-ins with you. Here's something that people might be surprised. I grew up as a latchkey kid. Like, you know those kids that you, you lock the door and go to work because you can't afford a babysitter? Mm -hmm. When we first came to this country, my mother was a cleaning lady working overnight shifts in big office buildings, which is why it's so weird that I'm in a space now where I'm in spaces where I have to hire and clean people. Cause I'm like, when I first came to this country, my mother was the cleaning people, you know what I mean? So I try to be really nice to them. But like when she made me a latchkey kid in that way, and it's not me downing her, there were times where she would come home and me trying to talk to her would be burdensome because she was just tired and needed to decompress. Yes. So as a child, I learned to not like take like enter people's spaces because I was always worried about being a burden. So for the first 30 years of my life, I didn't check on nobody. Not because I, I would think about people, I would pray for them, but I'd be like, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt mm -hmm. your day. So like what you would think not checking in was me being like, damn, I don't want to be a burden. It wasn't until I dated someone who verbalized, hey, Blue, you're so thoughtful. Why don't you check in with me? And I told him about my childhood trauma and he was like, no, I understand why you don't want to be a burden, but as the person who's dating you, it hurts me that you don't check in. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I'm giving him a space. I'm thinking he's happy I'm not being an ag. Someone had to verbalize to me that my trauma was coming off in a way that I didn't perceive, which is why now I check in because I've intentionally been told people do want to hear from me, but I had to get the green light. So I think there are times where someone has their own blind spot that's not steeped in their character or they're not caring. No, for sure. And somebody has to like tell them before they know better. And so I sometimes get a little bit nervous about expecting people to read your mind because it might just be somebody who's coming from a place of ignorance who doesn't know how it's coming off. Well, for me, the check-in is the, the pleasant surprise. Right. It's not something I'm um, looking for or expect from somebody. Right. I, I had to shave that off a long time ago. Expectations just make you mad. But I will say they do. this. They do. They're just set up to get you angry about... I, you'll be angry at home by yourself because you have all these expectations of people. That you no didn't verbalize, idea. though. So for yeah. me, it's a pleasant surprise. Um, if somebody doesn't check in, I don't go... Well, you got to say, the example I gave you was my brother. This no, somebody, I get that. So yeah. that was different. But for somebody else, I'm like, they didn't hear from me in a while. But I wouldn't be like, man, it's my... You know, he don't check in on me. I, I wouldn't get angry about it. You know what's so interesting? I check in on people now because I now, like I said, I've worked through, first of all, shout out to therapy. Can we discuss therapy? There's so many things that I would do, like, I don't want to bother nobody that I realized was me, like, being scared to be rejected. So I thought that I was, like, staying in my lane, keeping to myself, but I was actually operating from a place of fear. Like, I don't want to be rejected, so I'm not going to check in because I'm not going to get attached, mm -hmm. right? So my therapist, she helped me through that. But one of the things I think might universally be fucked up is, and I sent you this, it was this uh, meme that was going around on Twitter about a screenshot from a girl who had a morning job and she texted her boyfriend, good morning, I love you, at 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. And at 5 p.m., 12 hours later, he had still not said shit to her the entire day. And when she said, babe, it hurts my feelings that 12 hours has gone by and you couldn't even spend 30 seconds to like say, hey, I'm having a busy day. I was pleasantly surprised that you didn't take his side because on Twitter, all the men were like, well, I mean, if I'm busy, then she's just being a nag. But I was like, nah, bruh. It takes 30 seconds to say I have a busy day. I feel like I'm always on the other side of that. So what do you mean on the other side? I feel like I'm the one always trying to get the communication from people. So I, could, I, I can't do it. If you can't communicate huh. with me, I'm not doing it. I learned, like, it's just I'm not doing it no more. I'm not going to argue with you. We just don't communicate the same. I'm good. So if you send a good morning text and your girl doesn't hit you up for 12, 13 hours. I'm good. I'm not going to like end it right there, but I'm good. It's, I'm already leaning you can, out You can already tell that, yeah. Oh, uh, already halfway through the day, I'm already moving on. Wait, 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 yeah, wait. By, moving on. Wait, Devin said by new, honey. Because if we you can get a text from me early in the day and you haven't even, like, so say if you didn't see the text. Right. right? Say you were working, you didn't see the text, but not, not. At one point during that day, did you think about me yeah. to send me a text? Because it's times where we could be busy. It's like, oh, shoot, I didn't even see you hit me. I was just hitting you. Right. Like, oh, what's going on? Like, at no point during the day did you want to check in or hours. just see how I'm doing? Like, no, I'm cool. And, it's not, and I won't even be mad at you. I'll be like, you know what? We just communicate differently. I don't yeah. think you mean any malice. Yeah. But I, it won't work for me because then I will start getting upset. And I'm getting upset be, uh, based on something that you do naturally. Some people naturally just don't communicate well. I'm not going to sit For here and 12 get... 12 hours? But some people are like that. Some people are... 
and you know what I do? I learned this by sitting with people and talking to them. Some people really can give you their full attention. Their phone is somewhere else. I love that. So that means, yeah, I love it. But also, somebody might be texting their phone and be feeling neglected. So I know there's people out there who are in a situation, an environment where they put their phone away and they're engaged in an environment. Can, can I just tell you, and this is something that's different. I think if a friend doesn't text me for 12 hours, I'm not tripping. But if I am in a courtship space with someone. Yeah, it's different. And they, that's, I, I think those are different rules, right? Because the sexiest moment of my entire dating relation, dating history, and mind you, I started dating at 15. I am now past 40. So that's a full quarter century of dating. Child. Yeah. I'm long in the tooth. I need to find somebody. But like in 25 years, the sexiest courtship moment where, where somebody who was not my type suddenly became somebody that I was like, okay, we're fucking dating, was I was going to some dinner event and it was like one of my homeboys and we were just hanging out and we were waiting in line to get to this event. And I was like, oh, you left your phone in the car. And he was like, no, everything I need is right here. And I was like, oh. And for the entire night, I had his full attention. And that was the exact moment when I realized quality time, because I was used to having to com compete with a phone, compete with the text, compete with whatever. Mm -hmm. And the fact that somebody wanted to give me so much of their time that they put their phone in their car and didn't even need it to be in the restaurant with us. I was like, I think we should. It was the last time I ever shot my shop. I was like, I think we should date. I think we should do something. And it ended up being a very interesting moment for me of realizing how much I was. And when I asked him why he did that, he said, because when I'm with you, you give me your full attention. I just thought it made sense to give it right back. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the crux of when people watch how you move and have the desire to reciprocate it. Someone watches how you show up for them and say, I want to give this back. I don't feel good only receiving it. I want to give it back. And that's thoughtfulness to me. What you call communication, I call being thoughtful. And so if you are dating a girl and she's like, I'll talk to damage on Thursday. <laughs> And it's Monday. Or some people want to get to it at the end of the day. Everybody, this people communicate nah, differently. It's not gonna work for me. I, it don't work for me either. Mm -mm, but no. I did have to realize, like, it's not a not to me per se. Every situation is not a not. Oh no, to just me to mean that we we don't need to be together though. That's what I'm saying. It's like okay, the way I communicate, the way you communicate, is just not compatible. So I'm going to move on from the situation because what's going to happen is if I keep trying to get you to do something I want to do and uh -huh. then you don't do it naturally because you might try and you're just not good at it, I'm going to get mad at something that you're not even, you're not intentionally trying to hurt my feelings. Yeah. So I don't want to be angry at somebody who's not going out their way to be malicious. It's no point. It's like, but have that's you ever had someone say that that's who they are and act like they're just not good at it and then you see them in the next relationship and they're doing that shit just fine? Good. Then, I, then I realized it wasn't you could not good at it. You didn't want to do it for me. And that's another thing. That's very different. But also, thank you. If you didn't want to do it for me, you want to do it for the next person. I defi I I should be able to find some somebody that wants to do it for me. Yeah. So if that if you if this situation made you find somebody that you want to do it for, yeah. and somebody would do it for me, then we did the right thing. Maybe it was this interaction that made us find the people we need to be with. You know what's interesting? Something happened last night at the party that made me go, hmm. Um, a friend who had been single for a very long time, when I'm talking about like years and years and years, finally found a nice straight black man in Los Angeles. Sis, if you're watching this, shout out to you. Um, who is, she's in a beautiful relationship with. And we were all talking about potentially going on a trip. And I said to him like, oh, you're so sweet. I'm happy I got to meet you. Am I going to see you on this trip that we're, we've been discussing? And with a straight face, he said, I wasn't invited. I was like, oh. You know, I have a bad poker face, so I flit it off because I was like, I can't fix my face. In that moment, I was not judging either of them, but I said, I can't personally imagine finally finding my person, mm -hmm. telling everybody how amazing he is, and not at least giving him the option for this beautiful trip that I'm... Like, it's one thing if he just doesn't want to go. He's like, you have fun with your whatever, whatever, but not even inviting him. And so my question to you was... As a man, if you were in a serious relationship with somebody that you really felt this could be my person, mm -hmm. but they did not invite you to special moments, would that be an issue for you? Well, this moment is very particular, right? It's very specific. What was this This trip is to where and who's going? Well, I don't want to share too much of people's business, but it was, it was a, a special celebratory trip that uh, we were discussing. What I'm saying is, are other couples going? Would he be the only guy there? Like, does it make sense for there will be There will be a, a, other, a couple, other couple there, yeah. Just one other couple? Uh, I, no, that I know. I don't know who's fucking, but I, I know of at least one couple. I don't know that. that I, don't, I don't know. But to, to answer your question um, broadly, mm -hmm. 
Uh, you said, could you be with somebody and they don't invite you to special moments? Mm-hmm. Um, no. <laughs> nope. Dimmers got to the point. He's like, and mm-hmm. that's a no. Because I feel like I dealt with that too because I'm such a supportive person that I want to be able to be there to one champion you and to to have that celebration with you because I won't want you there when I have my special moment. So, yeah, yeah, no. Now, some things just don't make sense, and that's just your pride and your ego. Like, oh, I should be able to go there so you could just be weird in the corner and not invited and standoffish and strange. So, no, because I'm a a big king of, no, you go do that on your own. That's your thing. Right. Do that. But, no, I couldn't be with that kind of person. I'm in a relationship. I want to collaborate. I want to be a companion. That is me. So, for people that need their... It's not wrong with needing your space, but they always need their space or need these, you know, these their own lane for stuff. Me and them aren't going to be that compatible because I'm going to make you feel like you're a part of my life. I want to be a part of your life and I, I'm not going to force it. So 99.9% of relationships where I'm the one who broke it off was because I didn't feel like a part of their lives. Yeah, I'm not like, doing like, it. Like, why haven't I met your boys? Why do you keep going to these events that I'm finding about on social media? Um, I had a, a homegirl one time. She spent Thanksgiving with me because her boyfriend didn't invite her for Thanksgiving three years into the relationship. And his, and, and his family did not want her around. And so I'm like, sis, you're at Thanksgiving with me because your whole ass man does not want you there for a holiday 36 months into this relationship. They ended up breaking up because she finally, because I, I wasn't trying to be a troublemaker, but I was like, sis, I'm sad for you. And mm-hmm. so stuff like that, if you don't want me in the room, that kind of speak to there's something that i think might be a little bit universal i think not wanting your person in the room consistently and i like like a one-off feels like a universal like ooh red flag red flag red flag no it is a red flag because i've been in a situation like that it wasn't serious but i was talking to somebody and i purposely didn't want to go in their arena their public spaces i didn't want them in mind because oh i felt like if it did i just knew in my head i said i feel like this person is going to show out in a way that's going to make me not want to talk to him anymore and it's not that serious so why force the inevitable? I was ho- I was hoping I was wrong, but when Damage. It, but when it finally happened, they really showed their ass, and I was like, "See, this is what I needed to see. I knew this was it. I knew this was it, but I needed to see." But this. did she show out because you waited so long? Was it a self fulfilling prophecy? No, they just showed out. They oh, okay. Just did that nobody I would talk to <laughs> would do. It's like, why are you doing that? <laughs> no, it wasn't one of those. It wasn't nothing subtle. It was very like, wow. This is how you move it. <laughs> oh, was she being territorial in a way that was loud? In a way, she did do that. So, and I won't be too specific, but it wasn't a serious situation, too. It wasn't like this wasn't my girlfriend. So it was like, it was a serious situation for you. It wasn't serious. It wasn't like we wasn't boyfriend and girlfriend. So it was like whatever. And she could have got a feeling. She could have still had strong feelings for you. Oh yeah, I have feelings for her as well. But it wasn't like I'm not forcing myself to be where you at and where, where I am. Oh. But when she got where I was. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. If someone said to me, I'm not forcing you to be where I am. She was weirdly territorial, though. What yeah. she did was, um, in this arena that we were in, she walked up to a random girl and told, a, told this random female our whole business, right? Now, happens, oh. now, just so happened, this random female is a friend I knew for a long time. So the friend came to me and was like, you know this girl? I was like, yeah. She's like, she just told me all of y'all business. Like, and I'm very mm-hmm. like private. Mm-hmm. But not like, well, I won't tell my friends, but it's like, you don't walk up to a random person and be like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, it just mm-hmm. starts spilling personal business. Mm-hmm. And then I approached her about it. She was like, I never did that because she don't know how much I knew that person. So she lied to your face on I top was like, of it. Bruh. She's like, I never did that. Pro tip for anybody who's watching the show. Let's do a quick PSA. If you are a grown person over the age of 12 who is trying to date people, a mistake is one thing. Lying about the mistake is something different. I'm more likely likely to break up with you for lying about the mistake than for the mistake itself. Because it's one thing to have a misstep and be like, yo, you're right. I was feeling emotional and territorial. Let's discuss why I feel so insecure in this relationship. I can actually talk you through that. But to be caught red-handed and put like 10 toes down and lie to me, that's what will make me stop fucking with you. It's not even the mistake, it's the lying. But that's what it was. I was like, if she would just be like, you know what, I was, I drank too much, or right. I was this and I was that, and I really was, I, I, yeah, I, I was tripping. 
I'm like, all right, because you because you can move on from that. Right. When you don't even acknowledge it. It's like, oh well. Woo. There's one part of our conversation yesterday that made me very sad. Um, and I've been asked, I've started. I'm taking a shot. I don't know what you're please, doing. Yeah, please. I might need a shot for this one. Where the shot, we have, oh, here are the shot glasses. Yeah, there was one part of our conversation that made me very sad. And I'm realizing that I'm going to have to set a boundary with my friends. Because I don't think they are doing it intentionally. But for me, um, as someone who's like an energy person, um, it is detrimental to my mental health. Actually, let's take a shot before we get into this. This is the part where she gets a little bit deeper. As if we haven't already <laughs> jumped That's into the. Yes, let's take a. Let's take a shot to finding our bliss with the right people. I whites, salut. Here we go. Wait. <laughs> oh. I just heard the cheers last minute. <laughs> All right. Hit me with it. What happened? That shit is burning my chest. Yeah, it's oh, hot. That's a grown man drink. Tequila. Oh, tequila. Um, I realize that there's a lot of people in LA who think they're being realistic. But for the space that I'm in mm -hmm. and for the things that I'm trying to attract, it feels like dream killing. And so I've noticed that whenever the, t and I'm, I, I think I'm going to actually stop talking to some people about this now. I'm going to stop having this conversation the way that I, I usually do. When I talk about wanting to be married oh, and, wanting boy. To have, and wanting to have a family, there you go. it takes about 0 0.03 seconds for someone to say marriage isn't real. Nobody who's married is happy. Fuck you living in LA. You ain't never going to find love. And you just got to make peace with the fact that niggas ain't shit or bitches ain't shit and everything sucks and like get the bag. And my thing for that is that, that shit makes me sad when I actively are t tell you that I want to attract this thing. And my tribe is telling me never going to fucking happen. And I realize that people are being realistic based on what they've seen. Mm -hmm. But in this very receptive, open hearted space that I'm in. It fucks with me in a way that I don't think my friends realize. It, it's, it feels like saying, I want to be this when I grow up. And people saying, son, you're never going to be that. You know what I mean? Like, it, like, there are rappers who are millionaires and billionaires who still rap about the teacher who told them that they were never going to make it when they were seven. So let's be really honest that you can be a dream killer. And I think some of my I, friends... I want to speak on it, but we, let's get to the bigger point. I'll be wanting to speak on those little rap lines. I'm like, bruh. I know, but you know what I mean. But and so, if you don't come to school, <laughs> what you think your teacher going to say, bruh? I get bruh? that, but like, let's focus on the point, though. What I'm saying is... Yo, they be saying... That. There's a dream killing that happens yeah. when I tell, tell people that I want to get married that is starting to hurt my feelings. I do, too. And so I last night... And, this, and, I, and I then was debating talking about this. I cried last night after the party. Because I was like, I'm telling you my birthday wish, and on my birthday you're telling me it's not going to happen. This doesn't feel good. Did they say it's not going to happen or it's not? They said it's, it's not, not real. It's the bullshit. prize is not as it's, it's sweet not, as you think it is. No, they're, they're saying, I don't know, nobody who, 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 who enjoys it, who likes it, I don't see the point. Like, That's it's crazy. fake. And so my thing is, I understand my friends are speaking from their experience and they're trying to be real, realistic. I recognize that I can be the naive, I want to see the best in everybody friend. But if I tell you that I tenderly want something, I don't need a 20 minute speech constantly telling me it's never gonna happen. Cause for me, if I'm telling you it's cause I care about your opinion, it hurts my heart. And what was funny is in that conversation, you're one of the few people who doesn't kill the dream, right? And so my question is in this space, and you're probably not as sensitive as I am about this. How do you feel when you're someone who says that you could see yourself getting married someday and everybody in the room is laughing at you like, nah, that's never gonna happen. I've never been in that space cause all my friends are in serious relationships or married. Oh. So like you said, it's like their reality and I get it. Like if they know people in a bunch of nasty relationships mm -hmm. and they, and you know, and a lot of these people been in something serious where they probably thought they would get to that point and then it fell and mm -hmm. they feel like a failure. And this is the first time we could say projecting, you know, people yeah, are projecting. It is projecting. But it's just not my reality. And even if it was, I've always been a person where everybody goes right, I go left, always. I've always been like that. Because when I was little, I was such a follower. So I got mm. to a certain point in my life where I was like, oh, I'm done following because I, I learned like, it's all bullshit. I was like, oh, y'all all just believe in one thing because y'all want to. I've always did something different. People told me, oh, you shouldn't work with Jason Lee. Oh, he's this, he's that. It's been honestly one of the best working experience working at a place yeah. that I've ever worked at. And I'm like, and look at all the blessings that I've, I've worked described. at corporations that was way worse than this. This y'all were trying to warn me against this. Like I always went left because I'm a leader. Yeah. So if you think this is something you shouldn't want to do or that you don't want to do, I'm going to show you that it's cool. I've always been like that. I've always did something different. And people's like, oh, shoot. I never thought like, mm -hmm. I never thought about doing it that way. Even like when I was in high school, the girl I dated, no one 
thought to even look at her that way. And it was like, no, nah, I see it now. Like, I get it. Mm. Like, I, I've always been like that. So it's like, if I want to be married and I do, and you don't believe in it, I'm not going to knock you. But when I do it and how I'm going to do it, it's going to probably inspire you to change your perspective. Right. I'm not going to be influenced by what you're saying, because if that was the case, I wouldn't do anything. Something as little as riding a motorcycle, right? I learned how to ride a bike. Everybody's like, yo, you need to be careful. Yo, it's crazy riding bikes out here. I was like, I see more car accidents than anything. I said, damn it, just be, be safe, please. No, but... And, just and, be and, safe. And, and, and you were safe, and that, that's what makes And that's yeah. understand. Like, I get just that. Just be safe is very different than, oh, you're going to die. Oh, man, yeah. you know, I'm... <laughs> And it's some people that had real experiences, though. Like, it's my yeah. one friend, uh, Mikey. He's like, yo, my friend died on a motorcycle, man. Like, Jesus and I get, and I said, And I get Lord. that, bro. And I'm still going to do my thing. And I'm going to influence other people to do my thing. People yeah. that never thought about riding bikes, is, I'm like, yo, yo I'm, I'm, I'm looking at bikes, right? What you think? And I just started. Like, I've always been like that. So for people that do that to you, and, I, and it it's definitely different. Our situations with marriage is extremely different and I can get how that can kill the energy and I think you had the best solution of just stop talking about it yeah, I'm not bringing up because I think when you're at a certain point in your life and you really want something mm -hmm. that will kill you I cry I haven't cried in so long it it, it literally and I, there was no malice I think a lot of times we, we don't realize that people who love you can hurt you because they're thinking, doing what they think is best to help you, and they don't realize that it's hurting you, right? Absolutely. And so there was zero malice. Everybody loved me. I understand. But, like, I and was I like... I think that's where my stubbornness kick in. Yeah. Like, when people do that with me, I just be like, oh, all right, I'll tune off. I'll, I'll invite you to the wedding. I will... Sh yeah, I'll <laughs> shut off. I will literally... It'll be a button in my head that just turns off like, okay... Cause I'm I was gonna such do a it. care bear though. I was like, hey guys, this is hurting my feelings. No, but like, I, I was like, this is really hurting my but feelings, But I guys. also understand that. Like, I yeah. would never tell somebody to do what I'm doing because that's how I, I will handle the situation. But when you want something so bad and you desire love, And your tribe will is telling you you're crazy, yeah. It will hurt if somebody's like, oh no, marriage is like, uh. It's bullshit. They Meanwhile, all Meanwhile, all my friends are seriously dating somebody, about to get married, talking about getting married are married, been right. married for years. And even in their roughest well, can you, times... Can you introduce me to some of these people? I and even in their roughest times, they never went, I shouldn't have got married. Mm. They'll be like, man, you know, marriage is something. Yeah. But they'll never go, nah. They'll always at the end be like, nah, I love where I'm at. Because I'm like, bro, you want to be back in these streets? I'll tell you about these streets. These streets are ghetto. The, these the, streets are street. The dating pool has pee in it, y'all. Um, so I just need you all to be aware. So my question for you uh, to turn that back was, how do we stop ourselves from giving up on love? Like if you had to, and we're going to do a switch route. So I'm going to ask you to give women advice on how you would tell them to continue to, to find hope and love. And I'm going to do the same thing for guys. Like what tips would you give women about how to attract healthy love? And I'm intentionally saying healthy love because there's all types of love. There's struggle love. There's all types of love. I'm talking about healthy love in particular, healthy long-term love. I think, one, you have to really get in tune with who you are first. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you need to be single for 10,000 years, not like that, but really understanding who you are and what your nuances are um, and then going to those deal breakers and necessarily things you can compromise with because... One thing is a deal breaker where like, I can't deal with that. Right. And some things you need to be open to being able to compromise. Mm -hmm. Like there's things about me that somebody's gonna have to compromise with. And, <laughs> and but that's what people need to understand. Right. That you are not perfect. I am not perfect. Right. So I think once like for myself, when I realized there's things about my personality that somebody's gonna have to like really love me and compromise and understand that I'm coming from a good place. Right. Vice versa. And I think once I started understanding myself... Vi can we highlight the vice versa? That's what I'm... So y'all love to ask for shit that you're not giving. But exactly. Can we discuss that shit? But it because... started with me realizing like, okay, I got this thing about me, I got this thing about me, and I know what my heart is. I right. hope that when I get with that person, they can compromise and not bend, you know, or not, you know, not be where it's detriment to their, their to their life, but right. like where they can understand, you know, like I know where he's coming from. And then for me to want that, I have to be able to give that. Mm -hmm. So it's certain things like if I can't naturally deal with something you do naturally, where you like, you know, this is just who I am. I'm not going to get mad at you. You're just probably not the person for me. And there's going to be certain situations where I deal with somebody where it's like, you know what? This is who they are. I know they have room to evolve from it, but mm -hmm. this is a piece of who they are. They, and I can deal with that. That's something I can deal with. But I think it starts with knowing who you are first. 
because we can ha we all have these unreal expectations for people. It's un it's it's not going to work that way. So for me, it took me. Well, this is what I would say for advice: realize who you are, be realistic. Like you know what? There's some things I need to work on. I'm going to continue to work on. I'm going to get therapy, whatever that is. Hopefully somebody will be open enough to work with those things with me. Mm -hmm. And I need to be open to work with them on whatever that thing is, as long as it's not super toxic, negative, abusive. You know what I'm saying? There, it's, there's certain little things that I see people break up over and it's like, you know what? Could you not deal with it? And they'll call me on the phone. I'm like, could you really just not deal with this? Like, I just couldn't deal with it. And I'll say, why? And they'll walk through and I'm like, okay, so you made the right decision for yourself. And then sometimes I hear these things. I'm like, you're not being realistic, yo. You're not, but because this person might be working on like dealing with something when it comes to you, mm -hmm. and they're they're fighting that battle, and you gave up on your battle. So I don't know if that was advice. No, that was good advice. <laughs> I know that's like but just that, rambling. That, that's what they call a deep dive, and it's so funny because my advice to men is complimentary. My first advice to men is to examine their preferences, because a lot of time a man will say that he wants this thing, and he's focused on wanting the thing but hasn't examined emotionally why he wants the thing. And because he hasn't examined why he wants it, he is blindsided to all the different ways he could still get that feeling without getting the exact thing he thinks he wants. Perfect example, there's a huge debate right now during the gender wars about men saying that they want women to cook, right? And if a man said, I want my woman to cook because growing up I never felt properly nurtured or taken care of or food is the way to my heart expires, we've had this conversation. That's me. And, but he understands the reason behind it, right? And then he meets someone who's like, I'm not really a cook, but I'll always make sure you're fed. Or I'll take some cooking classes because I want to make sure that you know I see you. It's not a thing. To me, you're not getting a bitch who loves to cook all the time. You're getting someone who recognizes why you like that thing and is finding other ways to make you feel that feeling, even if it's not the Betty Crocker that you had in your mind. There are some men who, because they don't get the symbol, they ignore all the other ways they can still get the feeling behind the symbol. And so mm -hmm. I think men, a lot of times, particularly those who pontificate on social media, we've talked about the different kinds of male podcasters. There's the toxic, and you've sent me some non-toxic ones. Thank you, Damage. Damage actually sent me some non-toxic <laughs> male podcasters to restore my faith. I think a lot of times when a guy is fighting with a woman about cooking, he's not fighting about the cooking. He's fighting about something else that the cookbook represents. And because he's not being opposite, honest about the core, She's just buckling at being told she has to do this one thing because she's not being told what that one thing is being fed from. And so I think if men, there have been men in my life that I've, you know, I do this for a living, who I've walked through their preferences. And by the end of the, the relationship, they realized the thing that the symbol they wanted represented something much deeper. And once I knew what the, the deepness was, I was able to give them not just what they asked for, but 10 other ways of them feeling like that, that they hadn't even identified for themselves. And even when we broke up, they walked away with that gift, and now when they talk to their next girlfriend, they're like, oh, you know what? I need somebody who's nurturing and makes me feel like they want me to feel loved on after I've had a rough day fighting with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. That sounds different than, if you don't cook, then what kind of, like, that's, you, see, you see how different <laughs> that sounds, right? No, I get it. It's completely aligned with the but language. But that's advice for everybody. But, but we're talking about, this no, 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 but, no, no, but I like it, because that's advice for everybody. So if you know. Because what I usually say when you ask that question. Why different. I, I, when I tell my, my homegirls, I'm like, you need to examine your spark because right. I have friends that go on these dates and like, I just didn't feel that spark. And I was like, but the last time you felt that spark, what happened? He put hands on you. The last yeah. time you felt that spark, he cheated on you. And, and I was like, yeah. examine your spark because your spark meter might be wrong. It might be sparking for the wrong thing. So really examine why, what was it in that person that gravitated you so much Maybe you need something that's more slow roll. I'm not saying that person that you met that bored the hell out of you is your person, but maybe you need to give them more of a chance to open up and explore that situation a little bit more rather than going, oh, I didn't feel it. We did two dates. Eh. Like, I, he's nice. He, he, you know, everything's cool, but it's like, I didn't feel that spark. And I'm like, yeah, but when you did, we always go, I'm on the phone for three hours yeah. on the deep end with you because you felt that spark. Our demons tend to, I say this all the time, demons are sexier. So being healthy looks like boring to people who are used to toxic, right? And so another thing, my second piece of advice that I would give to any man who want to listen to it is um, be very honest with yourself about the difference between incompatible versus what is challenging you to grow. Because there have been times that I've been in relationships where someone said we were incompatible, where the very thing I was challenging them on was a growth, a, a moment of opportunity to grow that nobody but the person you're sleeping with could do. And so I have two friends who are dating right now. 
And I told them, I was like, I love seeing you guys argue. And they're like, why? I was like, because you're so lovely with everybody, but this person is able to get you to show the ugly part that you're scared to show elsewhere. And I love that you're being challenged to confront that in this relationship. And this person hates confrontation, but they care about you so much. I'm watching them sitting still to have conversations that they might not have elsewhere. There's so much growth and beauty in that. Stop calling it incompatible. You guys are growing each other. And I think a lot of times what people call incompatibility is somebody growing you. And I think a lot of people don't know how to tell the difference. So that'd be my two pieces no, of advice. people don't want to be groaned. <laughs> Did we just invent a new word? No, people don't want to know how to be groaned. Nobody and, and, wants it, to feel like they're dating their parent. But there's a difference between a, a parent and... Because a, a, a partner is supposed to grow you. Re relationships are supposed to be transcendent. If you are in a relationship in year one, and you're the same person in year 25, it, People it don't want you. their partner to feel like a parent. But you understand there's a difference between a, a partner and a parent, right? I don't mind it, but... But you realize that there's a difference between a partner and a parent. Some people don't got parents. They be talking about, you You act like my daddy, or you act like my... Like, that person ain't even in your life. How am I acting like something you didn't have? Ooh, the first shot has been fired. I will say this. Um, I That's ego. One of the things I would say to, to women, though, I, I will say to my, my, my fellow sisters out there, is that I think because a lot of us don't want to feel like um, we're having our voices snuffed out in our relationships, and that happens to us a lot. We've been socialized to do that. I think sometimes um, your masculine partner, whether it's male or someone of the LGBTQ variety, sometimes they can push you to examine parts of yourself that nobody else feels comfortable pushing you to because they want to see you win. I've had a homegirl recently who was like, you know, me and my, my man always fight about my friends, X, Y, and Z. And I said, okay, well, he's a really reasonable guy. What exactly is he saying? By the time she was done talking, I was like, sis, he's right. Your friends are trash. Mm -hmm. And so I think, but we don't, we, we don't want to feel like our man's our daddy. But I'm like, sis, your friends really are trash. So the, the, the brother made all the sense in the world. And then there'll be times where a man was like, I don't want my woman to nag me. But then I'll be like, but you are a trash communicator who talks in an insensitive way. And the person who loves you is trying to teach you to be a little mm -hmm. bit more compassionate. She's not being your mother. She's being your partner. But the problem is, like, why is it, it it's such an extreme to be like, oh, you acting like my mother. Oh, you act. No, that's what is. That's the respect. Yeah, it is. I want that from a partner. I want you to point out my blind spots and be like, yo, you need to, you know what, I was, I was people, you should probably work on this. And I'm used to people doing that. And I don't take offense doing to it. Doing what? As in, I grew up in a community where people can tell you how it is and mm -hmm. they love you. And it's not like, oh, you trying to be my, my daddy. It's not like that. It's like, oh, shoot. You point out something that I could probably work on. And when I do that to people, I do get feedback like, you kind of make me like you. Either, either they really like it or they, they, they take offense to it. It's like, right. oh, you, you give like these daddy vibes. I'm like, is why it is it daddy vibes? And why is it not just man vibes? I, I will say this. This is where I self-police, right? It's possible to have the right intention and the wrong delivery. Always. And so one of the things I've learned as someone who shows up with pure intentions is that no matter how pure my intentions are, in, intention doesn't negate impact. And so if I showed up with pure intentions, but I made you feel condescended upon, mm -hmm. I'm allowed to separate my intention from the delivery so I can re realize like, damn, I gave him some good advice, but I was repeating myself and condescending to him. Maybe the next time I'll say it differently. I'll say the same mm -hmm. thing, but I'll say it differently. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people are not open to recognizing that the right message can still have the right, the wrong delivery. Mm -hmm. and sometimes, Absolutely. And so, and, and so I think for me too, also sometimes the, the right delivery can have the wrong intention. I've dated a lot of very eloquent motherfuckers who are in this industry who know how to make everything sound pretty, but they're doing it with the wrong intention. Mm -hmm. So for me too, if your intention is fucked up, I don't care how nice you say it, why are you saying it too? And that's been a really hard conversation to have. I wholeheartedly agree with all that statement. <laughs> oh, well, that makes life easier. No, nah, because I'm like, that's a part people have to deal with with me. Cause, what? Because sometimes I'm just so direct. It comes yes, off you are damn as condescending. And I'm like, no, I'm just being direct. Ooh, but child. I understand. <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to analyze how I said that. And I'm going to get better the next time. Like, that's I get that. I appreciate So when you people being re that. respond that way, I'm like, no, I get it. Because I've been doing this. This is who I am. So it's not like I don't want to change, but at some point as a person, you still, you have things about you that just make you who you are. Now you can work on it. You and you're open to evolving. We worked on that. The yeah, last but it's episode. not always going to completely change. You're still going to be who you are. So it's like, yeah. Evolution it's... and completely change are very different. Evolution means that like, mm -hmm. it's still a, 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 a heightened version of what was already there. Change means you, who is this man? Like Harper, who this man? Mm -hmm. I want to pivot really quick to, um, yes, yesterday I was driving over here and I saw a mural of Virgil. And on the mural, it said, um, everything I do 
is for the 17 year old version of me. And that quote like spoke to me. I don't know if it's Virgil's quote or if it's something that somebody just thought went really well with the mural. Um, a lot of times we do things because we're like trying to heal or feed that younger version of ourselves who did not um, have the support system we needed. And then somebody else said, by the time you reach 40, you are the person your younger self probably needed. If you could go back to a 17 year old Abdul mm. and uh, tell him a piece of advice, what would you tell him to make his journey a little bit easier? To make it easier. I'm um, 17, I'm just graduating from high school, just got my first car, going into college with no money, broke as hell, borrowing book bags and photocopying books. Jesus, what is this, The Pursuit of Happiness? Lord. Okay. <laughs> this is um, a Netflix film, uh-huh. I don't know if I have advice. You wouldn't give him any advice? No. <laughs> you, you would let him just go through all the stuff yeah, he went through. Yeah, because everything he did made me who I am today. Yeah, I don't think I have any piece of advice. Nope. I do because I I I I feel like I'm my really therapist. I feel of like my therapist is probably driving a Tesla. Thanks to me, my advice would just be to talk to myself nicer because I feel like I had such negative internal dialogue. It's like I was I I was almost had like a winner's mindset, but I tended to mistake cruelty for accountability. And there were times where I thought I was holding myself accountable while I was actually just being unkind to myself. And so I think if I had had the chance, the one thing I would change was my internal dialogue right now, I talk to myself the way I would talk to a lover. I love the way I talk to myself right now. But if I had the chance, I think I would have started that much younger because there were several things that I let other people say to me because I was talking to me crazy. So that they were allowed to talk to me crazy. Mm. Like, you know damage that. I'm, I'm, I'll be quick to be like, please I rebuke that. Please don't talk to me like that. Like, so I think the verbal aspect, I would definitely have changed. You're still thinking about it. Yeah, I'm trying to think what I would say to specifically 17, leaving high school. That's a tender age, brother. That's a tender, tender no, age. No, man. Like, I had a dream I was pushing for. I didn't talk to myself necessarily crazy at all. I believed in myself wholeheartedly. I went to school to be a DJ. Everybody thought that was so stupid. <laughs> Is, and I got my job two yeah. years later on the radio. Like oh, I was shit. focused. Like I had purpose. This subtle flex is brought to you. It's by. not even a flex though. It's like purpose is so important to people. Yeah. Like you have to. And sometimes you can purpose out. Because I purposed out mm -hmm. where I was like I accomplished things that I always wanted. And then it was like what's next? And that's where I feel like that's when I needed advice. That age or whatever that was. Mm -hmm. When it's like oh I wanted to do this and then it happens. Oh I want to do this and then it happens. And then you're like. I don't know what my next is. I didn't think this would happen so quick. I would give that person advice more than the time where I knew I had, I was laser focused on what I wanted to do. And I did it. And at that time, I graduated from high school. I got into the college I wanted. I was just so happy. So what advice would you give yourself at your lowest point then if 17 wasn't the number for you? The advice I would give it to my lowest point is kind of like what you said, speak to yourself better and also understand that um, it's okay to be isolated. Mm. I always and Libras are not meant to be alone, so that's a big one for you to say. Yeah, but Child. I've always kind of, in a way, been alone. And I think coming out here, I had to be more comfortable because when you come out here, when you first come out here, it's this FOMO. Mm -hmm. Like you feel like everything's going on around you. You just trying to play catch up, and people are always not invite me to stuff or things that happen to people I thought was friends. You know, wouldn't include me in things, and that's been happening since college like I was kind of used to that but it was getting frustrating where it's like damn I'm so much about people and people mm. always push me out and then I was just like no own the fact that people do that like do your own thing be comfortable in your own world in your own bubble and create something beautiful from, from that and also a huge piece of advice was when you are frustrated with people that don't do right by you champion the ones that do even exactly. if it's a small few and exactly. I think I started doing that more because it's easy to go, oh, he didn't do this, and they didn't do that, and these people are doing this. But I'm like, but what about the people that did so they don't get any love? Like, pour into them because they did give you that love. They realized what you were going through, even if it's two people. Focus more into that because in my life, it's always been one or two people that changed my life every time. One person believed, changed my life. Another one person or two people go, 
I see something different that others don't see. I want to do this for you. That's and what change I've been talking about. Life. I'm looking for a husband. I'm like, I just need one husband, y'all. Y'all be talking about all these people. I just need one of them. But that's the thing. It's it's so easy. Like with social media, everything's about the numbers, and you want everybody yeah. to love you. You want everybody to pour into you. You want everybody to believe in you. You don't need everybody. It'd be nice. I ain't yeah. gonna lie. You want you want everybody to be cordial, but you just need you, one. You just need one. That one or two. It's not even that. Who cares who believes? Believe in the people that believe in you. That's it. You know what's so interesting? This is the perfect segue. I realized that I had another shout out. Um, speaking of, speaking of uh, believing and shouting out and championing people who believe in you, um, I want to quickly, this is what the camera is right now, Marcus, right here. I want to quickly give a, a, a shout out to Electrocast Media because the announcement that we're making is that this episode, after this month long hiatus that I took, because the bitch was, blown, was burnt out, um, we are officially, this episode is officially the first episode of season three of Human Eyes. Let's do it. Woohoo! Because we are officially part of Electric Cast Media as part of their Ruby Network. Um, it's really funny for me because I've only done uh, 25 episodes over uh, the last two years of the show. The first seven were before the pandemic. COVID shut everything down. I did 18 more and then realized how expensive production was and had to take a moment and pay some bills. But uh, Peter Raffleson from Electric Cast Media, I want to thank him because... For believing. He believed in me. He is not just Believe. the founder of, <laughs> uh, of the um, um, Electric Cast Network. He actually is a songwriter, producer, and musician who's worked with the likes of Madonna, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, Stevie Wonder, Elton John, Stevie Nicks, Britney Spears, Elton John, and now me. Big names. Big names. And so having someone like Peter during my darkest moment, like I had just left the job I'd been at for seven years. I was calling you freaking out, like, damn, what the fuck? I just lost all this money. Like I was freaking out. I've been there. And out of nowhere, <laughs> this rich there. white man calls me and says, Blue, I fuck with you. I love you. What do you need? And I was like, Peter, life One is crazy. Person, and he was like, no, we're going to bring in the network. We're going to monetize the episode. So if you're watching this episode or listening to it, um, those who are listening are going to hear ads because we're finally monetized. And I just felt like a part of me was like, why is this man who's worked with all these big celebrities showing up out of nowhere to believe in me? But you're right. It just takes one person takes to believe in you. It one person. And the crazy thing is, just to, to piggyback on that, there's so many platforms out there and people I know, I've seen them build these platforms. These are my friends. These are people I've talked to who have never really asked me to come on a platform to talk to me. Are you serious? But you have continuously done that. And that's oh. what I said. Instead of me going, this person don't let me come on their podcast and this person, you know, blah, 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 blah. No, you focus in on the people that do. Yeah. And, and that took me a long time to change that mentality because it makes you very, it can make you angry. It can make you bitter. It can make you very bitter. Yeah. But I learned like, no, nah, just pour into the people that pour into you because those are the people that really want to see you win and it will work. It always yeah. work. It always goes to the moon when you pour into people that pour into you. But it's such a hard thing to do. Because it's hard to not see all the people that turn their back, that kind of shade you. It's easy to see well, that. Damage, I've told you, like, people are threatened by you because you're such a, and I think it, it might have been Jeff or somebody was like, yo, Damage is so amazing. Sometimes I wonder if he recognizes it, right? And I was like, that's a good question. And I think there are people who see how amazing you are and how marketable you are and how polished you are in your presentation, and they're threatened by that. And they don't want to potentially put you in a room where you could be a bigger a bigger fish than them. And I think that's so stupid that's because sad. damage, if, if I pour into you, we all, the whole family eats, you know what I mean? Like that's there's, a sad there's, mentality. It really is, but it's very rampant out here, which brings me to the conversation that I really wanted to have with you on here. You know, and I, we won't say any names because we didn't choose violence today. Um, we've talked about how when you pour in other people, sometimes folks are using you as a come up. And once you help them in the room, they throw you away. You know, I've had um, issues with social climbers. Like I'm the person who, if they give me a plus one, I'm bringing a plus 10. Mm -hmm. I want all my folks to come with me. Let's go. And I've recently been in a situation where somebody that I brought along for the journey who I really adore othered me in a room that I brought them into. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, wait, when you had no access, I made it a point to say, I'm not coming in here without this person. But now that I've given you access, you're actually icing me out of situations where I should very much be involved. And it really, really hurt me. And you were like, Blue, this person found bigger fish. And it, it, it was hurtful to, to think of myself as a fish and not a friend, right? How do you deal with social climbers who you find out might be using you for a look and don't see you as a person? For me, and you, you always add lip things with a flex, and it, it don't be a flex, it's just for real. I've been 
very popular for a long time. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> but I, I feel like so now I, I, it's subtle. I don't, but it was something that I wanted right. at one point. So it was like me trying to be a bigger name and thing. Now it's like I could care less. Right. But because of that, I could always peep those people. Like I was on the radio when I was 19. Right. It was kind of unheard of. I'm in a market where everybody on the radio has been on there for 20, 30 years. So I'm used to people trying to latch on. So for me, I was always good at deciphering it out. And, and the people that I felt like Just were doing it. it, I didn't mind because I'm like, you know what? If this is going to help you in some way, take it. Because I'm always going to be mean. I'm always going to be blessed. And I feel like you just kind of got to release it. Like, you can't take it personal because that's what this game is. And I feel like for... But what if you're not in the game and it's a personal friendship, though? I know, but they're in the game. And so. even though you don't want to acknowledge you're in the game, you're in this media game. You've been yeah. in it for longer than me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You've been in this game longer than me. You don't realize you're in this game because you kind of made community. It's all about relationships. And you made it normal for you, but it's still a game. It's still a game being played. And for people that haven't... I'm in denial. Yeah, because you know why? You're like me. Like, you wanted it, but you kind of gracefully got into it. Right. You, you're forgetting that there's people that are punching to get in these doors. Ooh, that's a great point. Like there's that's people that are trying to kick in this door that's a gem. to be in these things that we kind of like, eh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I could care less. Because we've been yeah. doing it for a while and we're used to it. This this is still very Ooh. exciting for people. This is still very new for people. And you got to let them have their experiences because guess what? They're going to go through their own journey and realize what they did wrong. And you can't rob them of that journey. So if they ruin their relationship with you trying to climb, Child. then guess what? That's the repercussion of trying to climb and using somebody that, you, that was a good friend to you. You lose that good friend and you can't feel bad about it. It's like, yo, you lost me. I was really rocking with you. You decided to do that. This is what happens. Like, you know, no bad blood. I don't None. want you to be hurt or anything, but it's time for me to move on. You're going to move on. And That's you're going to realize it's going to be one point. It might not be tomorrow. It might not be next year. Maybe five years from now, you're going to look back and be like, damn, that was my real friend in this industry that I wanted to be in so bad. I fuck with people so hard, damn it. I'm like, that's my people. Like, I get really excited about championing my friends. I'm like, why are you being shady to me, bitch? I wanted you to win. Like, what's the problem? But the problem is you've been doing this for so long, and even though I'm younger, I've been doing this for so long as well, yeah, that they don't understand that just because it's shinier or cooler that it's better. So True. it's like when you get that, that it's like when you're on the block, you get that one old head talking to you that's done it all. Yeah. And he's just so laid back. You're just like, man, whatever. You don't know what you're talking about because he's did it. Yeah. So you don't understand that he already has the relationships. He's already good. He's made the mistakes and he's trying to give you this little piece of advice. You're so eager to get somewhere that he's already been. You don't understand how cool headed he is. So, so for people that's trying to get in this industry, where you just laid back about certain things, they're like, no, we, I want to go to that. I want to do this. I want to be a part of these moments. And you don't. And like you were cool at one point. Like I wanted to get close to you, but now you're starting to feel familiar. Yeah. Familiar is good in this industry, but Child. people are like, oh, no, this. It breeds contempt. This is the same thing. Familiarity breeds contempt. People think Once you're, they get, show you more respect from a distance than when you're up close. I deal with this t t today. There's people that, like I said, every time I say this, you call it subtle flex, but there's people that I've, I've accomplished a lot. You have accomplished a lot. I've been around people that have accomplished much. Mm -hmm. And because I'm humble in how I move, I watch how they treat me. And I'm like, wow, if I was to really flex on you, you would be shocked that I have this much pull, that I have this much respect, that I could do this and that. But because I come in a room and just act like a regular person, I'm, I, wa I want to see how you treat me when I act like a regular person. Thank you. I don't want to have to come out and be whoever DJ, who you think DJ damage DJ is, damage, pew, pew, which is pew, lame. Pew. Like, I'm me. Like, that's why I'm like, oh, what's the difference between damage and Abdul? There is no difference. I've always been me. But if I was to really... As your friend, though, I have to, I will push back on this. Damage and Abdul, for you are the same person, but I will say unequivocally, damage the persona and Abdul the man are not perceived the same way. It's, it's not perceived yeah, the so same way. Yeah, so for other people, Thank they're you. two different people. So people perceive the DJ damage persona, but when they meet Abdul, like the, the person that you really, really are, not the persona they created, they're like, why is he so nice? Does he not? And you know what's crazy? You know what moment I realized that we were kindred in this way? Cardi's party. Every... We were in line because usually at a certain stature, this is something I think I didn't even peep. I haven't waited in line in like a decade. So I'm like, we're in line. But then I realized everybody in the line was A-list. So when everybody's A-list, there is no, like it's just, I mean, for you to even get the invite, right? 
We're inside. We're in the VIP section. I'm not thinking anything of it. In my mind, me and Damage are having a fun night with friends and people that we know from work. Exactly. I'm not thinking nothing of it until I realized, first of all, OT Genesis is just like crumping and dancing to all the dance hall music. There's a security guard in front of us. There's a red velvet rope in front of us. And I realized everybody's watching us. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wait, wait. Right now, we're supposed to be the shiny people. But in my mind, we're just at a party having a fun Thursday night. And it wasn't until I got home, every friend who I did not bring into that party, yo, how'd you get into Cardi's party? Why didn't you invite us? Duh, 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 duh. But to see us pre-gaming that night, we were just acting like we were going to a fun like night with, with like friends. Like, and I realized, I was like, no, there are people who would not have treated it so normal. In their mind, it was like a huge guess. It's a big deal. We left a little bit early. There were a bunch of people, A, B, and C listers, waiting in the wait list, trying to get into the, the event that we were trying to get out because we were tired and wanted to go home. And what I realized is people need to realize value systems are different. Just because I'm not looking shiny doesn't mean I wasn't offered the opportunity. I might not have wanted that opportunity. There have been gigs that have been offered to me that I turned down that somebody else gets, and they're flexing. And I'm like, I turned that shit down like last week. You remember the reality show I got offered? I got offered a reality show right after I got laid off. And you would have thought I need the quick money. And I was like, nah, it doesn't feel good. It's bad for my brand. I couldn't look my kids in the face and tell them I was part of the show. And when you have a value system of, I want to make money to disappear, it's very different than people who want to make money to be seen. And I think a lot of times people judge me thinking that I didn't get the opportunity, not realizing we're just working with different value systems. And I think with you, it's the same thing. People think that you want to be seen. When in reality, how many times have we talked about this? Khalees, like getting rich and buying a farm and taking her husband and her babies and going off and living her happy life, to me sounds like a bigger flex than being in this Hollywood streets and being the rich nigga at 50 at the club, flexing on people. Mm -hmm. to me, but that's a value system thing. It's not saying that that guy is not living his dream. It's just not my dream. And I think a lot of times with social media, everyone's told that you, sh you should want to be a star. And some folks just want a life that feels good, not a life that looks good for the public. And, and for me, I chased that. You so chased what? I chased the fame. I wanted to be famous. And Ooh, when I got what did you pivot? Exactly. See, I wanted that. Mm -hmm. So that's why I understand. But I wasn't, you know, doing it to slight people. It's just like, I want to be the most well-known DJ. I want to be this. And when I was able to do things and see what it looked like, I was like, oh, this ain't me. Yeah, this is real. Oh, this is not me. And I get it. Like, some people, that's them. Or they want it to be them. And it's no judgment. It's for me, it's system. not me. For me, I have to be reminded, like, yo, you need to start doing more of this. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I still got to, I still have to, I'm still in this business. Like, I can't act like... But like, Fuck I, but yeah. like when you chase it and you realize you get there and realize, oh, this isn't for me. I can become more content with just being able to be in it, make yeah. a living and just be happy because that stuff doesn't make you happy. When you feel like some of these people that are at their highest highs are not happy. They're very depressed. They're sad. They don't know how to feel anymore because everything's so superficial. I can still feel. <laughs> so when I go out, it's man, it's been it's been it's been places that's not even. This is the funny part. At the most A-list events, mm -hmm. I could be treated like royalty, and at the most D-list events, I'm like pushed out. Yep. And for me, Big I just facts. laugh because I'm like, none of it is real. Like, if you really knew who I saw last week, this is not, okay, y'all, But if get you're an egotistical person, it yeah. can bother you. It can it can rock you. It amuses me. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Like, I've gone to events I love where it. it's like, yo, they saying like, not a lot of people on the stage right now. And I'm just looking like, okay. And then I was like, if y'all just knew where I was at yesterday and who I was with, it's, it's, just, it's just so, it's so funny. But I laugh because if you believe you're a shining light or a star, you're yeah. going to shine wherever you at. Yeah. Like now I go to party, forget the VIP. I could be in the middle of the floor. I am who I am and I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, right? you, you, you're good for leaving VIP. Damage will walk around the room. He's like, I'll see you on the other side of the room. I want to Because see I, I chased that. I chased wanting to be. I remember, oh, I want to be up there. If I could just be up there, if I could get a picture, I chased that. And then I was up there, I was like, Oh, this is whack. I'd rather be down here part. with the people. I want to feel. I still want to have a good time. So it's just like, you know, hopefully people experience life or if you in this industry experience, experience this industry enough to know where you fall. Mm -hmm. But I know where I fall. I'm completely content for once in my life. A lot of people can't say that. You know, it's so funny because, you know, your friend Mandy, who's now my friend. I love Mandy. Shout out to the See The Thing Is podcast and Bridget Kelly and Mandy. They got a seven figure deal. They're doing all these amazing things. Mandy has a two podcasts. One has a six-figure deal, one has a seven-figure deal. And she recently shared, she was like, at the time where I checked off all these things on my list, I've never been sad and had to get a therapist. Like, I did everything on my list, 
by 30. Same. And here I am, deep in therapy, like, yo, why deep am I depressed? Deep in depression. And nobody Same. talks about how Same. you can set these huge goals Same. and be incredibly lonely and sad because, again, what did I talk about when I was talking about guys' advice? What is that symbol? What's the core value or the core desire that the symbol was supposed to get you to? Because sometimes you think, once I do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to feel amazing. And when you don't feel amazing, you have to ask yourself, what feeling was I trying to get to and how else do I get there? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think I, I get a little bit sad sometimes because I watch people block blessings because things look good, but they don't realize they don't feel good. A perfect example is I was invited to this party. I'm not going to name any names because, you know, L.A. is so small. We say one identifier. People know who we're talking about. I'm at this party. It's all these amazing people in Hollywood. And it's a very, very curated list. I talked to this young lady for about an hour because I loved her spirit. We talked and talked and talked. We laughed. I was enjoying her, I think, more than she was enjoying me. Like, I was, it was a fun party, but you could tell that she was, she had what I call searching eyes. For anybody who knows me, I hate searching eyes. If you're my man, don't, don't be searching for other bitches in the room. If you're my friend, if we're having a conversation, look at me and let's have a conversation. But there's something very emotionally unintelligent about having a moment, but you're searching while the person's talking to you. It's very disrespectful in my eyes. She had searching eyes, and I was like, oh, man. I think she's amazing, but clearly I'm not shiny enough for her. It's a big room. Go talk to somebody else. At the end of the night, the shiniest person in the room recognized me and said my name. And she was like, wait, you do what? Suddenly her eyes got big and I had her full attention. She's like, let me, let me reintroduce myself. And I said, no, I already met you. Because why did you have to know what I do, who I'm affiliated with, and what popular people in the room fuck with me for you to suddenly appreciate the person who was trying to have a human connection with you for a full fucking hour. And it's gotten to the point now where sometimes when I, when I go to these parties, I intentionally act like I'm the help or that I'm just a friend of a friend because I wanna see who you really are where you don't know who the fuck I know in the room. And that's made me really sad because in LA people say, what do you do? Sometimes before they even ask for your name. Sometimes, that's, how, how are you? <laughs> hey, what do you do? What you do? Who you know? How you get in the room? Um, I wanna do a quick pivot because this is connected, but not. There's a show on, on um, uh, Netflix called The Ultimatum. I did not want to skip this show because we've been gone. The show's been gone for a month. By the way, now that we have sponsorship and shit damage, I, I want you to come on more. We're trying to see if we could throw you some, you know, some more uh, extended episodes because we love having you on the show. When you watch The Ultimatum, I know you only saw the first episode or we were still being there. I've seen like one and a half because I fell asleep on it. Yeah, the premise of the show is a bunch of people who are like 24 are giving their partners ultimatums about if you don't marry me, I'm out. My personal philosophy is anything I gotta beg or lie to keep ain't mine. Like I don't, if I have to do all that, it's not mine. Like I, I, it's, it's not for me. Have you ever been in a situation where you've given an ultimatum or received an ultimatum and how did you react? Because I think the concept of mm -hmm. an ultimatum is very fascinating to me. No, was it an ultimatum? Were you given it or received? Cause they can be subtle. Some ultimatums are subtle. Mm, I don't think I've ever given any. I think I received one. This is when an old girl was um, uh, whispering all my secrets to my, my good longtime friend that she didn't know was a longtime friend. Oh, shit. During that situation of us talking about that and her not admitting that that's what she did. Her lying, yes. She was like, we've been talking for a long time. I feel like if we don't make this official now, like, then I'm going to move on. I was like, oh, okay, we'll move on. How long were you guys talking? That doesn't matter. It does. How long were you guys talking? <laughs> it's actually one of the questions on here, so, that's, so this is the perfect segue. Doesn't matter. How long were you guys talking? It was a long time. It was a good long time. So what was the hesitation for you? Give me another shot. Um, it was me trying to ignore things that I seen that was there. Oh, so you didn't want to commit, so you were just... I was... Thank you, love. When we talk about growth, yeah. I was dealing with somebody that was growing in front of my eyes. Like, I watched them grow, but they weren't somebody that I would probably take serious. But oh. I watched them start transitioning. I was like, well, like, you're not like a terrible person. Oh, shit. Not, yeah, I watched them grow. Not that this doesn't suck. That's so romantic. <laughs> Let's do a toast to authentic growth. Yeah. Salute, eye wipes. Oh, this is going to burn. I can feel it. But it was also some denial because I was watching them. I was also hiding myself from the moments I knew that I wouldn't like. Drink up. First of all, I had an extra shot than you, all right? So I can, let me. Ooh, yes. I will say this, because the question that I actually had on here, and it's so funny how I have questions that you're naturally walking into. This is so symbiotic. Um, at this age and stage of life, and I'm intentionally saying that statement because 
this is, I feel like, how do I say this? I feel like in, we have like a 10 year age difference. I feel like in the two years that I've known you, I have watched growth that I think from on the outside looking in as somebody with my expertise, I think the growth that you've had in the past two years is a lot more drastic for me viewing it than it probably is for you living it. Mm -hmm. And there are things, and I have a great memory, you know this about me. There are things that you say now with your chest in 2022, that in 2020 you were saying the complete fucking opposite. I'm like, I don't even think he realizes this, how much he evolved on this topic. And so I ask myself sometimes, when, when we're, <laughs> was that another sort of, no, I have, you know, I, I'm a little OCD. I remember everything like that. It's re really weird. And so it's always interesting when you watch people that you care about going through a massive growth spurt and you can tell they can't tell. And I, I think this is a question I would not have asked you in 2020 that I want to ask you now. What is the longest that you think it would take you to be in a relationship and know this was your person for real, for real? In 2022. The longest? What's the longest and what's the shortest? Where I would know it's my person? Mm-hmm. I don't want to be no longer than a year. And what's the shortest you think it would take you? Six months. Oh. That was just a very evolved answer. What did I say before? <laughs> I don't know. It's a very evolved answer because I think up until I was 35, 36, my answer would have been, give me two years. And my shortest would have been a year. It wasn't until right before I hit 40 that I, I got to that answer. And so it's always interesting how I think when men know, they sit, and this is one thing you guys are better than us. Because you know we talk about how women are socialized to be more emotionally intelligent. But I think one thing that men run circles around us. When you guys finally know, you don't run from it. You're like, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I think women will be like, well, I'm ready, but he's not. So maybe I'll pretend I'm not ready and we'll go sw a swingers club and whatever. So what do you think got you to a place where you now can, within six to 12 months, know if this is your person? I think it's more about me. And Absolutely. I That's why the intro was about no, your No, 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 no. I'm just saying like, I don't want to waste somebody's time. Ooh, that's a word. Right? So, and, and me having a lot of female friends, mm -hmm. I know y'all time clock is different from ours. So if it's I feel like I don't reasons. feel it within a year, especially yeah. at the age I'm in, it's like, oh, then, you know, maybe we're just not, mm -hmm. this is not the situation. And guess what? Maybe we can come back to it. Maybe it's something we both grow and come back and like, hey, oh, maybe, maybe not. Or This isn't is our season. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, but I don't think I want to stretch something on more than a year and it not be serious. That's... What do you That's consider selfish. settling at this stage of your life? Settling? Yeah, because we had a conversation a long time ago about settling. What would be a thing where if, if I... I don't use that word. I know you don't, which is why I'm pushing, I That's why I intentionally chose that word. What is a thing that if you settled for it, you would feel like you were shortchanging yourself in a relationship? I, I, I don't even think I know how to settle. I don't settle. And I don't look at things as settling. I think I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a make this. I think for me, settling would be being with somebody who's not excited about being with me. I think for me, I've been with people who we logically made sense and they were ready to, to settle down. And so they were like, you know what, Blue? You're good enough. You're a sweet girl. The sex is decent. We have great conversation. Fuck it. And I was like, yeah, that's not romantic. Like, you ain't got to like act like a dog running to the door every time you see me. But for me, as someone who you call high energy... I have such a childlike excitement about life in general. The thought of being with somebody who's not excited to be with me and all the fun shit that comes with me, I don't think, I think to me that would be settling. I couldn't be with somebody who didn't recognize what a fun ride this is. Okay, so now that you said it, I think for me, because I'm trying to find something, mm -hmm. somebody that doesn't stimulate me mentally would be hmm. settling. So somebody that's kind of like really dull, don't like to oh. have conversation. Like, that would be settling. Like, also, like, she's a sweet girl. She don't say much. But, like, we don't really have, like, we don't say a lot to each other. But a lot of A-list men nice. like those girls. So you're being very atypical of the, of, of the... I do like a person that don't talk too much now. Yes, but a lot now, of A-list men want a girl who doesn't I talk at all. I gotta be careful because, you know, Cam Newton was like... <laughs> Child. I don't want to get Cam Newton out here. Please do not pull a Cam Newton. This is the last, like, 15 minutes of the podcast. I do not want to... I, I rebuke the spirit of that sound no, I ain't saying Cam Newton, but I, I do... Yeah, somebody that probably wouldn't, like, where well, I can't have that conversation with, because I think that's more important to me than almost anything. Like, 
If Even I can't sit down sex, with you. So, so yeah. you know, we had a conversation about this last night. We were up till three o'clock in the morning having a conversation with, shout out to Norm. Norm is the one who hooked us up with Marcus, our beautiful uh, uh, director. You know, I always say black men don't get called beautiful enough. So I'm telling you, Marcus, you were beautiful. But like a lot of men are, we, we're taught to think that, that you guys lead with sex. And I, I always find it interesting when I talk to my guy friends, how much that sex isn't as big of a deal as society tells us it is. Look, man. I can't speak for everybody, right? Yes, you cannot, Cat Daddy Abdul. That, that was the Abdul voice. Look at here. But you, when you, <laughs> but look, when you have lived life and you have done, and the you things, have experienced things, mm -hmm. you will at one point learn, unless you have like a trauma with it, and it's like something, mm -hmm. you, you know, then that's something different. Yes, yeah, but if you don't have like a sexual trauma right. or an addiction, you will learn that ain't that big of a deal. Yeah. Now. It, it means something. It can't be like terrible, but you'll learn that, oh man, it's so much more that I need out of a relationship than good sex. I think for me, when I'm just talking to somebody and it's not serious, good sex might be more important, more important than other things. Because if, if they're a seat filler, so they have a, a very... It's not even that. It's just like, it needs more thrill to it. But when I'm with a, a, a partner, I think I want to be with lifetime. Mm -hmm. The thrill is not going to come from just the sex. It's going to come from the conversation. It's going to come from the experience. It's going to come from... It's going to come from so many things that's not just sex. The person So I can't I can't personally lead with that. I can't be like, "Oh, the sex is amazing, so I just know it's her." It's like, "No, nah, yeah. sex is amazing, but it's like we got to figure some of this other stuff out there." I've had amazing sex and they were toxic relationships. It's so funny. Um and I debated talking about this, but fuck it. This is the season 3 premiere. We got ads and shit. We're official. Um back in October, I had a conversation with myself. Remember when I had that weird date with the white guy? who wanted to wear my underwear on our first date. And I was like, this is, not, this is not my kink. Let's not do this. I had a conversation with myself because afterwards I had a, you know, uh, an entanglement with my maintenance man. And usually it's he like- He was really the maintenance man? Yeah, for like the past like two years. <laughs> He's, it's the most stable relationship I've had in LA, unfortunately, is with my maintenance man. And we did what we usually do. And I felt so empty afterwards. Mm -hmm. And you know how they say, by the time you're thirsty, you're dehydrated. I realized in that moment that I'm such a, I've been such a sex positive advocate for the past 20 years. Lord, I feel like I'm aging myself. I didn't realize that something in me had shifted from being the sex positive, go to play parties, dominatrix girl to like wanting like emotion and affection. And I was like the very thing that used to feel a need felt sad to me. And it was weird realizing that there were times where I thought I was wanting sex, where I just wanted affection. I was like, I'm not actually all that sexual. I mean, I am sexual, but I realized I'm more affection deprived. And see, that was sobering for me, realizing see, how affection deprived I, see, I was. See, for me, I think halfway in through my journey, I realized that. Like, I knew it took it me was. a while, child. I was swimming from the no, it was, I think it would take most of a while, but I yeah. started to realize that because... I said this on um, Hollywood Unlocked years ago that I watched, who was his name? But he was on a breakfast club randomly and he was talking about his, and I don't, I'm going to misquote it. It doesn't matter. I'm going to get to the point. Paraphrase. Yeah. He was talking about his relationship with sex mm -hmm. and how he was like, I didn't really care for the sex as much as I needed the affection. I knew this for a fact that I hated sleeping alone. Mm. So I would do all the other stuff to get to what I really wanted. I knew that like halfway through. It was like, of course you like, you want sex as a young man, right? Mm -hmm. But I knew what I really wanted was that feeling at the end where I'm laying with somebody getting that affection. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminds me of what you're saying because I live the life. Damn, <laughs> it was out here in these streets, y'all. But, but now I'm at this point where it's like <laughs> I could care less about it, where yeah. I, I can gladly turn situations down because I'm like, I'm not looking for that. Right. But it took me a while as a man with my ego going, well, how does that look if I don't want to have sex? Right. You know, there's a thing that we have to deal with as a man. It's like, oh, this beautiful woman wants to do this and this and that to me, and I could just tune out because yeah. it's not what I want. It feels... I wouldn't say it feels dirty. It just feels cold. It feels empty, like you said. So I, 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 when I say I overstand what you're talking about, I've been in so many situations sexually where I was just like, I'm not really even here. Once she's done, I'm going to pretend to be done, or I might just be done and then be like, dope, it's over. And I hate when I'm in those feelings where it's mm. like, this don't even feel like what I want it to be because I know what I really want. I want the affection. 
And that's, I think this is why I keep on making the jokes about my uh, affinity for massage porn because it's like, I realized the reason why I liked it was because watching a man, oh God, I, I can't about to say this. Watching a man love up on a woman in a way without having to penetrate her was such a foreign concept to me. It was more like voyeurism, like, oh, he's not trying to drill her. Like, he just mm. wants to make sure she feels good. And uh, how do I say this? I'm just being honest. Fuck it. I think a lot of my queer experiences were not because necessarily that I wanted to have sex with women. It was more so women make love men fuck. And so if I wanted someone to like, I'm be- <laughs> It's not true. I'm telling you my experience, right? Cause I got an experience. So I'm telling you in my experience- and Women fuck. No, no, women fuck. I'm talking, I'm talking yes, about- Yes, they do. No, I'm talking, no, no, I'm not saying women don't fuck. Oh, no, no, I'm just saying. But I'm saying that <laughs> if, I wanted to, if I wanted to have, like to have somebody make love to me, it would have to be a woman because men were only fucking. And so for a long time, I associated being with women with tenderness because it was the only place where there was any kind of tenderness. And so I think the first time I saw one of those like raunchy, like what you guys call raunchy little uh, viral videos of men doing whatever, I was like, he's being so supple and like kind to her. Like, what's that about? And I had to realize that I was dating people who were only attracted to how wild I was sexually and not to like me as a person. And that was a very interesting conversation because a lot of times I think our sexuality is around feeling, wanting to feel seen, but like, who are you? What is that old saying? It's not who wants you at two o'clock on Saturday night, it's who wants you at 2 p.m. on Sunday morning. Them Sunday mornings weren't hitting the same because it'd be like, we'd have a fun Saturday night, but Sunday afternoon I'd be by myself. And Sundays used to fucking hurt my feelings. Like, oh, we did a lot of things yesterday. Why am I eating bread for myself? And so I think a lot of times we have, again, symbols, right? We have to be honest about what we're actually looking for. Mm-hmm. I had a friend recently though, and this is where shit gets a little funny, on the other side of that, she's met somebody, great sex, very affirming. They make love. He's amazing to her. But we had dinner and she admitted to me, he's done everything but say I love you. He has a block around saying I love you. My question is, could you be with somebody who's fulfilling you but had a block about verbalizing that they loved you? you know how long they've been together? A year. Yeah, you got to slow roll that. A year? Yes, a year. Just because you are in love, that don't mean he's comfortable oh, saying shit. it. Oh, shit. Wait, so let me yeah. get this straight. Because this might seem like a contradiction, so I need you to clarify. You know within a year, but you're still not saying I love you? You said you would know if you were ready to get married within a year. but you You're speaking say. very fast. You would know within a year, you said recently, like mm-hmm. a couple minutes ago, that you would know within six months to a year this was your person. Mm-hmm. But in that same year, you wouldn't say I love you. No, where did you get that from? You just said uh, you have to That's slow That's a whole nother person. That's me. That's how I feel. This person has their own journey, their whole walk of life. Oh, so you're not saying you agree with him. You're saying that you understand. No, I do agree with him. I mean, the thing is, just because you feel this emotion and this person's doing all this for you, y'all might be having an amazing time. That doesn't mean he's at that point yet. It's but only no, been a year. No, he's claiming he's at that point, though. I, I might, might skip that part. Oh, okay, yeah. He's you got to claim- add that in there, because it's like he might no, just be like, oh, I'm loving this situation. No, I'm still he's, trying to he's at that point, but he just he doesn't like saying it to her. Oh, well, that's something I feel like when we talked about, when I was talking about that advice where there's mm-hmm. things about ourselves that somebody's going to have to deal with. If she can't deal with that, she's going to have to move on. But if that's the only thing and he needs help with that, like, I do love you. I just, I'm not good at saying that. That might be something that you can bring out of a person that might make the relationship so much better where you could get somebody that truly loves you to be comfortable with saying it. I think it could be dope, honestly. (laughs) I feel like a a loving situation. I will say this. It could be. I will say this, and this is my personal experience. This has nothing to do with anybody else. There is somebody who demonstratively, through acts of service, showed me that they were deeply in love with me for several years. Never said it. When we parted ways, this person denied ever loving me to everybody we knew because they hadn't said it. And the fact that someone could take away all that years of acts of service based on the technicality of not saying it, there's a zero percent chance that I could be with somebody who would show it but not say it. Like for me, I would feel but that's like that's that's a situation that you're gonna have to move on from. That's no, 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 no. But I'm saying for me, it just wouldn't work. That's what I'm saying. I don't want to move on from it. I actually don't. Well, I actually don't want to move on from it. But he's saying I do feel like that. I just have trouble saying it. I would not feel safe. That's personal, though. No, I'm saying, she, but yeah, but, but I'm saying that, that she and I had a conversation. She similarly has had people lie on how much they love her in public, and she's like, I don't feel safe with someone who will not say it to I me. don't want to be with somebody that just says I love you all the time and don't do anything that shows you love me. So mm-hmm. I'd rather it I'd rather not have it the other way. I, I I can't do I can't do it either way. If I don't get both, 
I'm out. I think if that's the only issue, I think it's worth uh, working out. I think if you if you if your love language is words of affirmation, it's not, it's a huge issue. It's of course it's an issue. Yeah. But it's still worth working out. It's not worth throwing it all away right now. If you guys are working on it and eventually it just doesn't get there, then yeah, yeah then it's like okay, you know what? I don't like the way you communicate. I need that move on. But if it's not something that you you got to work on it, and nobody's gonna come perfect. So it's like yeah. if that's one of the main things where it's like it's just he doesn't say it. I would give it some time to see if I can get him to that point. And then if not, then... How would then, you advise her? Um, I don't think it's a time thing. I think it's a feeling thing. I don't think, oh, in the three weeks, if he don't no, say it... No, we said a year. Like, we're not, let's not be facetious and, and downgrade I'm just saying, it, I can't yeah. put a time on it. If I say, oh, if he hasn't said it again in six months, then it's a feeling thing. You would know. You will feel it. If you're putting effort into it and it feels like he's not even trying, then you got to walk away. If you feel like, yo, he's really trying... He said the other day it felt a little uncomfortable, but he's he's starting to, he's starting to say it more. She would love that. That's not happening. Yeah, she would love that. Well, you know, everybody's situation is different. Yeah, the reason I asked that question is I wanted to hear a male perspective because I'm championing the relationship and I really hope they work through it. Um, but I think if you've been with somebody for a year and they're showing you they love you and they're telling you that, no, I do feel the same way, but ah, uh, last person I said it to, she burnt me, so I don't want to say it. I would feel at a certain point our relationship is being haunted by somebody else, and that for me is a red flag. But isn't it the same on the other side where you said that happened to you before, and because somebody didn't say it, you're now haunted by somebody not saying it? No, you know why it's not because it's my it's my love language. So for me, needing an that doesn't for, trump it. To I'm me, I'm I'm, I'm gonna it. I'm gonna respond and finish answering on my own. I'm saying there's a dif difference between recognizing what you need versus being scared to be vulnerable. They're not the same at all, actually. It's a false equivalent because where I'm coming from is a place of love and safety. For me to feel safe, I need I love you. And you're saying for me to not be rejected, I'm not going to say I love you. They're completely opposite, actually. They're diametrically opposed realities. And, and One there's a nuance to that that I'm not going to try yeah. to go back and forth. You can go to that, but agree. I'm saying that for I me... Anybody saying what they need to feel safe cannot feel the same, to feel affirmed and safe is even in a fear of rejection. He's scared of being rejected. You can't equate it to one being worse than the other. No, no I'm not saying that. That's worse, all I'm saying. I'm not saying they're worse than the other. I'm <laughs> oh, saying, yeah, that's they're, all I'm complete, saying. they're not the same at all. It doesn't have to be the same. Yeah, but, it, but you're it's saying the, that it's a false equivalency. So a false equivalency means they're not the same. You get stuck on that, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, however he feels, it's just as equal as how she feels. Mm -mm. Well, yeah, we're going to have to uh, Yeah, we can agree to disagree. Here's the thing, right? Because, and this is something that I universally always want to point out because when people do false equivalency with relationships, you're either feeling, feel, feeding love or fear. If I, if anybody, fuck, fuck if it was the other way around, it could have been her. Fuck, for, forget gender. If you are doing something mm -hmm. that feeds love, that is not the same as something that feeds fear. And so for me, it's not even about the I love you. It's about the intention. So what? it's not, so let me finish. It's not about the I love you. It's about the intention. Remember we talked earlier about something can sound real nice, but the intention is what, what I call bullshit on. He is operating from a place of fear. She's operating from a place of love. There's no version of reality where I'm going to acknowledge or accept that love and fear are, the, are, are equal. It could be argued the other way too. How? It can be. No, I'm asking you how. For you not saying I love you when I want you to say it, I'm in fear that it might not be what it seems. It could be argued the other way. She's... What okay. I'm saying is, you know what? I don't know these people. Right. So I can't really speak to the... Yeah. You know more of the nuances yeah. of the situation. I don't. I'm it's just okay saying... It's okay if we disagree. Yeah, I'm yeah, just saying okay if you disagree. blankly look at it, I can see both ways. However, this is a specific situation that right. I need more intel on that we can't talk about. Right. Because I'm sure if you gave me more details, I'm like, oh, well... He's scared and she's feeling... She's like glowing and in a great space and wants to make sure that everything's reciprocal. He's scared of having his first healthy relationship. Yeah, well. I can't call them equal because one person is evolving and growing and blossoming and the other person's a tight fist. And I think sometimes... There's always going to be some. Yeah, but I think, I think what the problem is, and this is something that I think is an ugly truth that I actually am comfortable with, that people used to call me kumbaya naive. It's the one ugly truth I'm comfortable with. Everything's not equal. And I think a lot of times in relationships, we lie to ourselves and pretend like we're equals in all situations. This is going to be a situation where my man is going to be more involved than me and I'm going to have to take a back seat and be like, he's way more involved than this. We are not fucking equals in this situation. I understand that he has something to teach me and there's going to be places vice versa mm -hmm. where I'm much more involved in running circles around him without even trying, but I love him enough to give him grace. And I think 
one of the biggest things that I don't agree with in relationships that's very popular is that we always have to compromise. Bullshit. I think a lot of times when you're constantly compromising, everybody's walking away like, they, like they're still hungry on a diet. What really makes sense for me personally is if something really fucks with you, like it bothers you, and I'm just annoyed on GP, but I want, my ego wants an intellectual win, I'm going to be like, well, we're equals, and so I should have equals say. No, my version is if it really fucks with you at 80% and it annoys me at 10%, I'm okay letting you have a win because it matters to you more. I'm going to let my partner have a win. And when something really matters to me... You know that could be considered a compromise. I understand, but, talking, but here's the thing. This is what, this between semantics. This is why I'm, I'm unpacking it. What matters to me, though, is not a compromise. I'm, I'm letting you have a win. We're not compromising. I'm letting you have all of what you want. And there are times where something deeply matters to me and it mildly inconveniences you. I want to win. A lot of couples, what they do is nobody ever gets to win. They're constantly doing half and half. And I think there's something beautiful about having someone who can pick their battles and saying, this isn't as serious to me as it is to her. I'm going to let her have it. Or, sis, like I know Twitter told me I should cuss him out about this, but it actually isn't a big deal to me. I'm going to let him have mm -hmm. this win. And I think ego says that we always have to compromise and nobody ever gets to win. I enjoy letting my partner win. I enjoy people who let me win sometimes. And I think a lot of times ego will say on principle, not on your heart, but on principle, everybody got to give up something. There are times where somebody gets to win, and I think... Well, I agree with that. My strongest relationship is where people get to win but each time. the problem with that is, if he would say, whoever this mystery person is... And shout out to my homegirl. If she sees this, sis, I'm not saying your name. I hope he doesn't see this. If he ahead. was to say, I'm going to let her win, and I'm just going to say it, and it doesn't feel right... But he, but he feels it, yeah. That's going to be a problem, so right. it doesn't work there. Yeah, it doesn't work there, yeah. Because if he's like, you know what... I just want to say to make her feel good because it's not really a big deal to me. But if he's saying it doesn't have that feeling she wants, then it's a whole nother situation. But and that thing. might even be worse. You, you know what, what, what it got to me was? The gestures he does to show he loves her are 10 times more sweat equity than simply say it. And she's like, not only is he not saying it, the shit he's doing to show it are so much more laborious. Why is he going through so much extra to not say it? And that's when he admitted it was trauma from a previous relationship. Yeah, it was trauma. And hopefully, you know, if he really loves her and she loves him, that they can help him work through that. Because if that's the only issue, that'll be such a great thing to overcome where it's like, yeah. my man had so much issue saying, what well, I, I love you, but he loved me so much. He worked through it. And now we're here. I look at it as something That's what we're hoping amazing, for. It looks like we're an amazing project. Well, and that's the funny thing. We can thing. only hope. I am rooting for them and my homegirl, you know who you are. I love you, sis. It's an amazing hope. We had dinner and Don't I said... Don't give up hope. I told her, I, 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 said, give him an, I said, give him another year. Don't give up on him. But if after two years... I mean, yeah, at this big ass <laughs> age we are, yeah, don't give him... That's what I'm saying. I'm, a, I'm not going to give it a time limit. If somebody to say, I love you. <laughs> I, I don't give things time limits, but it can't go on for five years. Like, it needs With, to be an active yeah. year of trying, too. Like, yeah. not a passive year. Like, yeah. us like, yo, let's really figure this out. How can... Like, yeah. You know, you know why I, I wanted to end with this is because I think sometimes when we talk, we seem very kumbaya. I wanted to workshop this because I think there's a way to push and challenge each other in a conversation and find out sometimes we have the same intentions but different words. And I think a lot of times men and women are not shown in this social media age mm -hmm. working through a, a, a piece of gristle and getting to a good place. They're just shown disagreeing. Everybody's hurt. And I think one of the things that we did in the first episode that spoke so much to the audience was they watched us unpack, disagree, realign, fix the words, nuance, whatever, and work to understanding whether we agreed or not. And I wish that there was more opportunities to see black people in particular do that. Because one thing that bothers me, Damage, and I'm going to be very honest about this, I have a lot of interracial friends, so I have nothing against interracial relationships. But I think one of the most dangerous things that's happened in this colorblind world is that we've skipped over black love. We've gone straight to mm -hmm. a Shonda Rhimes show where every black person has an Asian person or Indian person or some exotic person to show that a bunch of biracial babies are gonna save the world. We completely skipped any moment where we were allowed to watch black people love on each other. And I think the intention was good, but that's a huge fucking thing to skip. And I wanna see black people, particularly black men and black women, being allowed to love on each other and not going straight to let's all be colorblind. Because mm -hmm. we, we skipped that huge wound and went straight to something else. And so I'm hoping that in our own way, we're showing people that black people can love on each other, whether they agree or not. Well, I mean, if you're trying to argue, you're looking to win. I don't, wanna, I don't like to yeah. win conversation. I'm looking to understand. So yeah. if you talk to somebody, 
even if you don't agree and you're looking to understand something from it, yeah. then you can have a better conversation. But most people, they just start debating. It's like, I have my side and I want to beat your side. If I'm talking to somebody and it happens to be coming back and forth and I feel like that, I'll just walk away. Right. But if both sides are willing to understand a piece of what someone's saying, like, okay, I get what you're saying there. Right. Well, you're saying it's a little different than what I said. Right. And it's easy to come to like, oh, okay, so I get what you're saying. I learned something new. You get what I'm saying? You learned something new. Right. That's it. But most people, when they get in this thing, like you get defensive. Yeah. I don't take myself so seriously. So I'm I'm easy to go. Just listen to go, oh, okay, I see what you're trying to say. Or, oh, I get that. Or, oh, like I'm looking for that. If you're not looking for that moment, then you're just going to argue. Or you're going to walk away. Or you're going to try to overpower by screaming. You're going to do whatever technique you have to win. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are competitive. I'm not that competitive. When I want to speak to somebody, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to hear. Even if I don't agree, I'm like, well, you did say one thing I kind of understand. I like that part you said right there. There's always something you can take. From a conversation. Right. I could talk to a dude on the street with a fifth grade education that could say something deep to me. Or oh, I'm absolutely. Like, fucking lootly. Oh, that was some deep life stuff you said right there. I learn more from street niggas than I do from academia if so you much. Learn, like... if, you're, <laughs> if, you're in, if you have intentions in a conversation to take something from it, though, if you only have intentions to dominate or my way or the highway, then it's like, I'm going to shut down anyway. I'm just like, oh, well, cool. Whatever. You win. Like, you got it. You know what I love is that, like, I always say this, it's not me versus you, it's me and you versus the misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And the only time I want something to win is when love wins. And that's, that's so kumbaya. I wish I was less of a fucking hippie, y'all. And so anytime you see me get hype, it's because I feel like the love is not winning in the conversation. Like, I feel like love should always win. And so any conversation where I feel like love is not winning, I get very like, no, think about it. Like, like and I get very excited about that. But I think people mistake me fighting for love with me fighting with them. And so I just want to thank you for holding space because one of the things that sometimes makes me sad is people don't understand that passion and emotion are, are different elements. Um, emotion is water. I told you that, 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 that thing. That's not the same dragonfly, though. Um, no dra no <laughs> that's, not, that's, a, that's a mosquito. But no, people don't realize that emotion is water and passion is fire, right? I'm a very passionate person, but I'm not super emotional. And I think sometimes when I'm being passionate, people mistake that for me emotionally shutting them down. One of the things I love about having you on the show is that, like, you don't mistake my passion for me emotionally trying to shut you down. So, Damage, we've been giving you flowers this whole time. Um, this has been a great conversation. Flowers. Black men get flowers too, y'all. <laughs> See, uh, Damage and Marcus are taking home these roses. <laughs> um, is there anything that you want, any lasting thought or anything that you're doing that you want to share with us? Um, I do know one thing that I want to say on your behalf, please. What? Your Wednesday night events for the people in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. Oh, Hello. Yes. Um, we have an R&B night called Brown Sugar. Ooh, on those voices changed. <laughs> at the Continental Club. Um, and right now, that's all I'm comfortable speaking about. I have a lot of beautiful things to come. I cannot speak on it yet because it's one of those things. But hopefully next time I come here, I can talk all about it. There's something amazing that's supposed to be happening potentially this week. So oh. we'll just see. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have stuff to promote. I'm just happy, you know, so I'm going to promote that. I'm happy. I'm in a great place. I wake up with no weight on my shoulders. That's I'm amazing. loving life. My mom's healthy. My son's healthy. My brother's fine. Aww. Like, I have nothing to complain about, so I have nothing to promote but my happiness, so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which I is a big deal because I was depressed and I didn't know it for a very long time, so. What made you know it? When everything slowed down, like when you mm. when you have things to work on and projects and this and that and that, it's easy to push your emotions to the side. But once I had to deal with it for years and get out of that funk, I was like, man, I'm happier than I've ever been. I'm happier than when I accomplished all the things I wanted to accomplish. So I'm in a good place. So that's what I want to promote. Being in a healthy mental space is so important. Promote that. I love that. And I just want to tell you guys that uh, for those of you who've been asking about my emotional intelligence workshops, um, they're done live and we're coming back in June. So please stop harassing me. Um, I was shadow banned on uh, Instagram for posting self-help content. Instagram got some problems with black content creators, but we'll get that into that in another episode. But if you do want to be a part of my workshops, please go to OTS22.eventbrite.com um, and log on because we're doing a whole eight week series of our emotional intelligence workshops, uh, starting with uh, the, the first Thursday in June, all the way until July. Damage, I would love to have you show up 
on one of them because I think that'd be about really emotional tough. intelligence. Lord, all right. Damn it, you're very emotional intelligent. Okay, you, you, you said it. Okay. It was an uphill battle, but we're here, nigga. Let me just play. <laughs> you're yeah. very emotional intelligent, and also again, I want to uh, thank Electric Cast Media. And for those who want to buy my candles and products, go to bluecentricshop.com. This is Humanized. I hope you enjoy listening and or watching this episode as much as we love doing it. And now we have to clean up this fancy house to make sure I get my deposit back. Bye, guys. Goodbye, damage. Peace.